Hey guys, what's up? It is week 206. Let you guys know the Severn contest is still going on. We'll draw on uh, week 208 for the four-year anniversary, so in a couple weeks. So if you want to enter to uh, for a chance to win Perdita Durango, Day of the Beast on 4K, a Scream in the Streets on Blu-ray, and um, Nosferatu in Venice, all you got to do is send an email to David Parker, uh, 1986 at live.com. So it's in the description box and all the information below. So yeah, they're great releases. I covered them a few weeks back. So if you're interested, check it out. So since uh, Creep Show uh, season two is back on Shutter, it's about the only uh, television show I keep up with. I guess I'm gonna do a little bit of Creep Show recap. I think I've covered everything except the cartoon episode, which for some reason I can never find on Shutter. I didn't look too hard, but uh, so the Creep Show episode one season two, yeah, it's two shorts on there. So far, uh, so good. So the first one on here is definitely a nostalgia piece. It, it talks to all those monster kids that had Aurora model kits growing up and stuff like that. And although that was before my time, I still had the Aurora model kits growing up. Um, so yeah, so what happens here is we have this, uh, this young kid who's obsessed with monsters. He's bullied, he's picked on his mom. It, it's very on the nose, but it does not, that, that doesn't necessarily mean it, it, it's not, um, successful at what it's trying to do. It's very on the nose, but it's, it, it does exactly what it's supposed to do and it works. So basically what happens is he has a mom with cancer, is very sick. And uh, an aunt he really likes who's married to a douchebag and Kevin Dillon. Very well cast. Kevin Dillon's very good at this. And uh, this is a period piece, too. I believe it's probably, what, the 80s or 70s or somewhere around that time. So uh, basically what happens is the mother dies. She, he has to live with the abusive uncle who's kind of a loser, doesn't have a job, that kind of deal, and his aunt. So... Uh, his mom always told him these like wonderful things about film and if, if it's there, it'll live on within you. So you kind of start to uh, see this kind of thing forming with the film and all that stuff. But the, it, it's a direct shout out to the um, original Creep Show with the wraparound story um, and ordering the voodoo doll out of the, the magazine. So I'll leave it at that to a certain extent, uh, but it does end up incorporating some uh, universal monsters and all that kind of stuff, which is really cool and fun. And and of course, like any good anthology show or movie, just desserts are served and they're served well. Uh, yeah, so this one I thought was really well done and uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, now on to the next one, which I actually do remember the title of this one. I think it is a, a video fundraiser of the dead or something like that. I, I'll put the things below in the opening. And uh, yeah, I've heard people saying they compared this one to Evil Dead for good reason. I even heard uh, one of my friends, Mike Merriman, say that this would have been a better sequel than uh, the or better fit in the franchise than the remake of Evil Dead, a reboot or whatever the hell you want to call it. And I wouldn't really disagree with that either. So basically what we have here is this PBS uh, fun fundraiser going on. Also feels very period piece. I doubt PBS. I know that NPR and that kind of stuff does fundraisers and stuff like that, but I just don't really see people watching that much uh, PBS kind of style television anymore. Maybe I'm wrong, but essentially maybe they need the fundraising now more than ever. Um, so basically what happens is we have this fundraising PBS style show. There's this kind of reading rainbow show on there, or just like a lamb chops kind of deal with this really rude lady who obviously is very sweet and nice when the cameras are on, but when they're off, she's horrible. There's also, um, an antique road show style show on there. And then there's a Bob Ross style show as well. But uh, Bob Ross' character has some things up his sleeves and kind of a dark past. So essentially what happens is this guy brings this book that was in his garage or is his fruit cellar. You guys understand that shout out um, for years. And it's the Necronomicon. So before they appraise it, they have to open it with this key. And there's a lot of great gags and everything. It's Ted Raimi plays the guy who brings the book in. So it's it's winking directly at the camera. Of course, you know exactly where this is going. Evil Dead style demons on a PBS style fundraising program. Um, basically broadcasting out to the entire world. I laughed out loud at a couple of the gags. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Ted Raimi is great. The Bob Ross painter is actually fantastic as well. <laughs> and I love his backstory without spoiling too much. Obviously, kind of a shout out to that old, uh, you know, that myth about, um, geez, uh, Mr. Mr. Rogers being a, a Vietnam sniper with like 20 confirmed kills, that whole whole fake kind of thing that there was that was complete bullcrap. So if anybody's still running around saying that, that's not true. That wasn't true. But that's obviously kind of a shout out to that. But anyways, uh, I enjoyed this one. It has some gore. Uh, I could have watched a whole feature length of this, I think. So uh, anyways, uh, 
movies that take place or, or TV shows that take place when they're actually like on set live television is always kind of fun. I immediately think Howling or Nightmare City has a really cool scene where the, the um, infected, because they're not zombies, right, guys? Don't want don't to upset anyone. They're zombies. I'm calling them zombies. The zombies run amok during the uh, broadcasting and start ripping off all the people's shirts and before they stab them because I guess that's what zombies do. Rip off your shirt before they stab you. So maybe they are infected. Zombies don't do that. Um, Italian zombies do, though. So anyways, uh, really recommend The Creep Show. Uh, enjoyed it quite a bit. And um, if you ever wanted to see the Gill Man face off against the mummy, then or the creature from the Black Lagoon, Gill Man copyright. Um, yeah, so yeah, check it out. It's good stuff. And I'll probably uh yeah yeah there's should be a little maybe a, a series kind of show thing here that I, I found and then i enjoyed that so yeah and i i didn't want i don't even watch trailers so i'm spoiling a trailer i don't even watch them but i did check out the uh, here in the very beginning that had keith david narrating it and i was like yeah he's gonna be in an episode so uh love the creep show stuff keep it coming Okay, this one we have up is uh, from Arrow Video and is The Invisible Man Appears, also including The Invisible Man vs. The Human Fly, which is an absolute ridiculous title, but I love it. So these are Japanese Invisible Man uh, films. One, uh, The first one, Invisible Man Appears, made in 1949. So uh, it's been a long time since I've watched the original Invisible Man, and so I don't know if I've ever saw any of the sequels. But anyways, uh, yeah, so it's a long series, about five or six films from Universal, and then some other Invisible Man movies popped up, Invisible Man. Maniac, these ones, of course, Hollow Man and um, Visible Man from last year. So a bunch of these popped up. And there's actually a special feature on the disc with Kim Newman kind of breaking down all the Invisible Man movies and talking about these. But I, I found it really interesting that I really had never heard of these Japanese Invisible Man stories, which kind of crazy. Um, and it's also really interesting that they even exist to me. So the first one, The Invisible Man Appears, is basically we have this love triangle going on with these two scientists. And like they, they kind of are following this lead scientist who's like this kind of, they look up to him and he has a daughter so they both really like the daughter they're both kind of courting her and they decide to make a gentleman's bed i guess i'll call it that says whoever gets to the the discovers their experience you know their experiment first gets to ask her hand in marriage which pretty dated right but it is what it is it's 1949 so before any of that can happen the good doctor leaves a note and he's disappeared but we know that he's actually been kidnapped so um and he's been working on invisible man serum as as well as one of the young kind of scientists and basically what happens is um the serum has been stolen or basically he's been stolen and held captive and there's some bad guys that want some riches and it gets really complicated and convol a little convoluted here and there and you don't really know who exactly the Invisible Man is, and then there's some competition and everything. Um, the ending is actually pretty pretty sad, pretty tragic. I actually like how it ends. Um, the movie overall is decent. I don't absolutely love it, but I found it very interesting and unique in, in some ways, but also kind of similar to like those spy espionage movies. Both of them kind of feel that way, um, like that Japanese spy uh, movie about the motors and stuff. They kind of have that kind of gimmick too. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of players in this and everybody's backstabbing everybody and there there's some silly things going on. But uh, yeah, I, I, um, I would check it out. And they do have some cool effects too. But uh, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about the Invisible Man versus the Human Fly, which the title, I was like, this one is made in 1957. I, I was just kind of laughing at the title. I was just like, I can't wait. Out. And right when you think 1957, although I believe the original Fly, was it was it 58? I can't remember 100%. Maybe it was before that with Vincent Price. But right when I heard 50s Invisible Man versus the Human Fly, I immediately thought like a Baxter Fly from Turtles or the original Fly. So I was like, ooh, we're going to see like an actual old school like Universal Monsters bra movie. But it's, it's a lot different than that so it's not a direct sequel to the original movie the uh the way the invisible man is created is completely different it's not the same and um the human fly is not really a human fly um he doesn't look like a human fly he's just really tiny and carries out acts of terrorism so basically a bunch of murders are happening and uh they're not they know there's no witnesses they're in planes they're in parks and right in front of everybody and nobody knows how it's happening and they start to think some sort of supernatural element and they start to look into this invisible visibility kind of weapon that turns certain things invisible but they have not perfected it to do it to people yet but not yet right so basically and then they stumble across all these people they realize that there was a common thread and they start to kind of look into it and we realize that the um it's actually a human fly who's been shrinking himself down and the serum he's using is making him crazy kind of very similar you know because anybody that turns invisible goes mad like the first film i probably should have mentioned that or in the hg well story i think you go mad from it too so uh, basically we do have kind of a showdown and some terrorist acts this one i feel ah, man which one do i feel like if you take them both elements from both they would fit 
bit more with the Invisible Man if you take elements from both of them. But um, I do think I preferred the first one, maybe, possibly. This one is a little goofier and sillier and has more, um, you know, trying to get a necklace and goons and more tv kind of style to me like bad guys and characters but they're both interesting they're both kind of cool and i think they were supposedly lost so the elements aren't great on them but they look pretty good um yeah check them out the invisible man appears in the invisible man versus the human fly Okay, this next one here is the feature debut film of Nico Makarakis. This is from Aero Video. This is Death Has Blue Eyes. And that cover is awesome. Like, I didn't even register that this was a Nico movie. Nico did Island of Death, The Zero Boys, um, so many movies. Uh, he's had a lot of uh, Blu-ray releases in the past few years. Nightmare at Noon. Jeez, who? Um, Arrow did a couple other ones, too. I can't think of Hired to Kill, or I think so, with Brian Thompson and Oliver Reed. But Nico Makarakis is a... a Greek director and he's a really interesting director like he's one of these guys that I love his interviews he's always so full of energy he's always funny he um he will self-depreciate at times and he's goofy and is is like he plays jokes with his editing and takes like these different elements and stuff like that regardless I've always been a fan of him personally no matter how I feel about most of his movies um which though I don't want to say it like that because most of his movies I like so there we go. So I guess it's a it's a positive. I like his movies and I like him. Um, in particular, Island of, of Death because I am a sick person and I like the crazy video nasty stuff. But so we have here, Death Has Blue Eyes. And this is his feature, his debut. So I don't even know to go about this movie. It's obviously post-dub, you know. Um, they probably didn't record sound there and then they dubbed it over in Greek and English. This version is in English. And this is a bizarre exploitation film. It's very kitchen sink, but also feels a little ahead of its time in some of the elements. So we have these two kind of buddies that are just low rent criminals. They they do these kind of criminals. It's all played kind of for laughs at first. Like they, they uh, the one guy steals this old guy's identity and the airport takes his plane ticket and flies to meet his friend. And uh, pretty pretty soon they're, they're like using his identification and trying to charge, you know, rooms to like uh, at hotels, charge like different rooms, the bill and all that. Kind of stuff and some people overhear him and uh, it turns out that it is this older woman with a younger woman and the younger woman is a psychic and she can read his mind so we're already starting completely crazy right and it appears that we have some sort of weird kind of group that is focusing on the psychic woman and wants to eliminate these friends that are going to get involved with the psychic women and everything like that. Did I mention that there is a menage a trois love scene fairly early in the movie and uh, some a strange strange scene where the woman is constantly dressed nude and kind of like a um, maid's outfit or like an apron and nude. It's just super weird and silly and also light but but dated so we have all that going on like this weird love triangle this buddy movie and we have this psychic kind of element supernatural thing going on and and there's just so many weird scenes within the movie like they decide to leave one of the friends um the psychic girl and the other friend just to be assholes and he's wandering and he's really upset and then all of a sudden this race car driver wings around the road and picks him up and it's a beautiful woman and they almost have sex and it's just like this is so weird and, and at the end we get these big stunts with helicopters and it's just it is fairly inept to be honest at times where i'm like where are we going with this what are we doing but um there is some cool stuff in here like when they zoom in on the eyes i liked and just that it's so weird and puzzling that i kind of was interested in it i don't love it but it's it, it it's you know it's a peculiar movie to be honest so that's death has blue eyes and i know the psychic stuff was used in a lot of movies but in this kind of way i mean I guess it's kind of fairly early. This is 76, I think. He listed it at 74, so it was early. It was early for this kind of thing with all this mixture of stuff and everything like that. Just a batshit weird movie. But there is an interview with Nico Makaraskis where he kind of like, they, like, um, it's weird. Like Arrow seems to have partaken it and they like wish him a happy birthday and do all this kind of elaborate stuff with it. And it's really cool. And, um, he just seems very grateful for Arrow. And I just like the guy and everything he has to say about the movie. He's always been very honest. So he'll basically tell everything that's true. And he's just like, why do people like the movie? Maybe it's the, you know, the explosions, the buddy stuff. And, and he's right. You know, he understands film and he understands editing. And I think he edits like the new trailers and stuff. I think he's a professional editor. So like a lot of his trailers, like the new 
cuts will look very modern. Like that, like they look like they're made cut by a very young person and everything like that. And, and Nico's like 80 years old. So, um, just sharp, sharp guy. Um, so yeah, anyways, there's also an interview with one of, with the lead actress in here. So yeah, it's a nice release from arrow of a weird movie. And they do say Jallo kind of inspirations on the back, I believe. Where is it at? And I was just like, huh, when I saw the term Jallo and I was watching it, I was like, really? Um, I, maybe I'm just misremembering everything here. But uh, I, I honestly, with the title and just kind of first glance, I was like, is this a Giallo? Death Has Blue Eyes? And then you see Nico. I'm like, hmm, that's strange. But anyways, uh, Death Has Blue Eyes. We're checking out, especially if you're a Nico fan to see where he started. Um, he always started big, man. He was ambitious. It's not like he was just going in and I'll just make a little small movie. Uh, uh-uh. But uh, oh, in that feature at that kind of show early in his career, too, how he worked on television and all that kind of stuff, too. So, yeah, it's nice to see. OK, this next one here, I'll be kind of brief with it. It is Hollywood High and Teenage Mother. It is one of the Dark Force drive-in double features. And I guess I'll start with Hollywood High, also from 1976, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't really know how to go in depth about this one because it's very sexploitation, light, goofy, uh, 80s sex comedy deal. So basically it follows a story of three, uh, a group of kids, three guys, three girls, and they're all kind of, or is it four guys and four girls? I cannot remember 100%. Um, it's four guys and four girls. So they're all kind of just goofballs and all the women are super gorgeous and the guys are just kind of like crazy and goofy and it's just super weird and silly and the jokes are just non-stop but a lot of them don't land and they just have like some ADR moments but anyways um every scene goes on for way too long too like they'll have these dance moments and these montage scenes and they're goofy but I did laugh a couple times the dialogue is really really goofy um and it's just I guess I I just say it was light fair um there is a scene a food fight in here that had me gagging because it's an Italian restaurant and the kids are being punks and the, the waiters and waitresses and the cooks they all get upset about it so they start having this elaborate like 15 minute fight scene with like Italian food but it's all watered down spaghetti because they obviously we're using like you know didn't have enough sauce or something and want to make it look red so everybody's like getting this watered down spaghetti thrown in their face and throw down their pants and i'm just like oh man i just anytime like food is like rubbed into people and just like people are covered in food it's just i want to gag even though i eat like a slob and i'm probably covered in food all the time but i'm not i don't have to see myself like in a mirror eating or i probably wouldn't eat anymore but um just watching these people covered in nasty like dry like watery spaghetti i'm just like ugh, it's just unpleasant but there is a subplot on here which i don't i mean i don't know where the movie's focus is to be honest like what is the major plot of this movie so the subplot is the plot i guess so they meet this uh this ex like uh movie star and she's like a man eater upper i guess like she just like invites the boys over and tires him out and there's this whole weird gag with her and everything like that but uh yeah i enjoyed the movie for what it was um it's stupid and it's full of nudity and sex and of course a perverse cop and of course stereotypical perverted teachers one of which who is the like a over-the-top gay stereotype and they're both pedophile teachers that are like constantly like saying awful things and the the one teacher you know is making the kid do something awful so it is what it is um as for the b feature and i will call it a b feature it's teenage mother which is an older feature but it's kind of like a, a teen kind of exploitation film where I, it, it, this one didn't really do much for me. It, it was kind of a, a little bland, very bland, actually, kind of very boring. And then there is a real uh, like pregnancy shown in it, which is kind of just like, whoa, that kind of takes you back. But it basically follows the story of a, a young girl who wants to be pregnant and she makes up this lie and there's like an attempted rape on her and stuff like that. This one did not do very much for me, to be honest. But when that uh, birth scene happened, it, it kind of takes you back and it's like one of those deals where they're like you can't pass this on the censors like, but it's showing the miracle of life and they're like uh, i guess you're right but um anyways uh if, it, if you're interested in the b-movie double features hollywood high and teenage mother check it out uh i would stick it with hollywood high i think is the better of the two but hey Okay, this next one here is from Culture Shock Video, and this is Good Night, God Bless, aka Lucifer. I actually prefer the British title, Good Night, God Bless. I think this is a, this is a British film. It was made in Britain or released in Britain first. Here it was Lucifer, which is a very generic, forget kind of title. This is a movie that was shot on 
16 millimeter, but edited on tape. So I think it's a tape master. Best it's going to look, okay? And it looked pretty solid for a tape master on here. So good night, God bless. Opens up with a pretty gnarly scene, to be honest. I was kind of taken back. It opens up with a, like a school shooting of a, a priest kind of wandering. Uh, he's kind of like out of focus. You don't really see his face. He wanders in and he starts shooting all these kids down and they're, they're falling on the ground. And it's just it doesn't really show that much, but the way it's edited is still effective enough. I mean, this is a low budget movie. It's a feature film debut by a guy named John Ayers or Ayers who went on to do monolith and shadow chaser, which are some sci-fi movies that I think I have monolith here, but I never had a chance to watch it. And the shadow chaser titles I've always seen at the video store. I don't remember if I ever rented them or not like those kind of sci-fi action movies and stuff like that. There's a lot of those in the eighties and nineties, late eighties, early nineties. So it opens up and it's an effective scene. And I was like, well, wow, it's pretty, pretty impressive for what this is. Um, but I guess for what it is, I didn't really know what it was going to be exactly. Cause I, I actually did not ever see this one. I, and I'm looking at my VHSs, and it was one of the titles is like, did I have this? And I did not, I did. I had a bootleg of it. So, um, as it, this is the first time watch. So as it progresses, we basically have these detectives that come into the scene and one it's in Britain, but there is an American who transferred there. So, uh, he's, he's talking to everything and, and almost immediately he starts a conversation. Like they go check out and, uh, talk to the uh, surviving victim. And he starts to talk to her mother and learns a lot about her. And they, they kind of like hook up a date. I was like very plot convenience, but Hey, I, I mean to move it along, I don't really care that much, but what, what really the movie is like really terribly paced. And I think that's like what everybody said. And I actually turned and checked out some of the commentary and they said, the first thing people say about this. And I, I agree completely is that it, the opening's crazy and uh, really well done. And the rest of the movie is very slowly paced. And I was like, I mean, that's all I had to say really about it, to be honest. But I guess I'll get into some more details about the film. So there's this priest going around uh, killing people, but he has a main focus on the surviving woman and her child. So the cop obviously has an interest. And they start dating on the American cop, and he's always like trying to save her from the killer. The killer is also going around and killing other people. All the kills are off screen. Almost all the kills are off screen. All the violence is off screen. So like this movie being advertised possibly as a slasher, I feel like people would call it a slasher, but it's more of a police procedural. And I know that giallos can be a police procedural and be more of a slasher. They kind of, but they have their own, you know, tropes and stuff and techniques that make them a giallo. Like when you just turn like a slasher into almost a straight police procedural, it really doesn't feel like much of a slasher because the characters getting killed are either cops or complete unknowns that just walk on a, a scene and they're slashed. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. So, um, the dialogue between the cops is really painful really painful and it, it, it the dialogue's not very well written i guess this the, the script was 30 pages long so that kind of explains it maybe these guys are improving on the set but the british cops always busting the americans balls because they don't like them they're like hey i'll bet you're on the take and it's just like who is writing this like i know that they probably saw serpico and it's just like it's just like you shut up like it's that it's just like nothing there's no good dialogue. It's just really weird. And there's a couple of plot conveniences too that I really don't mind, but just really dumb things like they know the killer is stalking them nonstop, but the cop is supposed to keep them at home, but he's like, let's go out. Let's go out instead. So they go to the movie theater and it's like, that's a bad choice. It's a dark place. No, you can't see everybody in there, but okay, let's buy it. Do you sit in the back corner so nobody can sneak up on, behind you? No, you sit right in the middle front row. So anybody can get behind you, anybody get in front of you. It's just like, this guy's not a very good cop. I mean, there's probably a reason he left America um, and went somewhere else to be a cop. But it, at the same time, you're just like, whatever. Um, towards the ending, it does kind of pick up and we start to get some body count. Um, but the weird thing is, like, this, you think this movie's pacing. You're like, it's got to be an hour 45. No, it's like an hour 32. So the the, the time, run time isn't that bad. And, and I think some people may get, like, kind of a kick out of it because it is maybe unintentionally funny in the dialogue with the police officers and everything like that. But um, I do ap uh, appreciate the ending was creepy even though i'm like what uh maybe i missed something i don't know and the ending's creepy and it's plastered all over the front vhs cover of course it is because there's only that's the only scene in there like it um but the idea itself that a, a killer priest demonic killer priest killing children is scary you know um it is uh so yeah and I just realized I forgot to give recommendations for all the other movies I talked about already. So I guess I'll go back and put little clips on there, just uh, the title clips. But um, yeah, I don't really like this movie. I, I found it kind of dull. 
I thought the acting was kind of lackluster and weird and the writing wasn't particularly great. I thought the concept was decent. Um, yeah, I just, it, it's a little inept too for me and, and for how slow it is. I mean, there shouldn't be no ineptness for how slow it feels. It should, everything should be explained to a T and I don't need everything explained, but I shouldn't be asking questions like you shot the guy out the window. Did you ever check if his body was laying there? Or you just cut to the next scene. It's just strange. I, I don't remember ever showing that scene or that, that moment. Um, and the cops are all cartoons and weird and the, the chief to me looks kind of like Stephen thrower uh, a little bit but maybe mixed with like skinny orson wells but he's just um he like yells at the the cop he's like don't lose your temper and it's just like aren't you losing your temper aren't you losing i mean but that's a that's a cop trope right the chief's always mad he's always mad um uh there is like i said a commentary on here by actual fans of the movie which is nice because you don't want to get a commentary of people that don't like the movie what the hell's the point of that and they seem to know a lot about it so that's cool um and it does have a cool slip cover so if it's up your alley it is a movie that i had to get anyways because i had the bootleg so it's just like yeah you got to get it or it's got to get off your checklist it was always one that people would be like not on dvd horror movies and it's from 87 so yeah um good Good night, God bless. Um, and, and you could easily make a lot of dumb jokes. Like at least the movie was polite enough to wish me a good night's sleep. Good night, God bless. Uh, Cause it put me to sleep. Yeah. All that kind of stupid shit. But I know there's gotta be fans of this movie. And um, it is, guess, I guess an interesting point for a kind of an independent director's first movie, but uh, it didn't do much for me. So yeah. Oh, if I got to pick one to go with it, I'm going to pick another kind of low budget uh, stuck on VHS uh, movie called judgment day. I think probably around the same time, maybe late 80s, early 90s, Judgment Day. I thought that one was kind of interesting, had some cool things to it. So, yeah. Okay, this next one is from 2016, and this is actually uh, Under the Shadow. This director did Wounds, which came out a couple years ago, which I couldn't stand Wounds. I thought Wounds was awful. But Under the Shadow interested me a lot more. It sounded like it'd be more up my alley, and it definitely was. It was a very good movie. Um, so it takes place in Iran um, during an Iraq-Iran conflict where the countries are bombing each other. Um, we have this uh, this. This woman who's married has a kid and she basically wants to go back and um, get her doctorate. But this country is very, you know, chauvinistic, very male centric, very uh, unfair and everything like that. So uh, she's basically going back for it, but she's denied because something she did when she was very young. Her husband is a doctor, but um, so there's this like turmoil between them, of course. So basically what happens is the, the husband is sent to a frontline area to help where it leaves them kind of abandoned and shit is about to hit the fan. They're targeting their city. The other country's targeting their city with bombs. So uh, people start to leave the, the, the apartment that they, they live in. They're leaving and the town's becoming more, uh, you know, deserted. So, but there's something else going on too. There's a supernatural aspect of the whole entire thing. A young boy had recently moved into the apartment because he had lost his family and he somehow brought back this kind of strange gin with him. And a gin in this, um, you know, it's, it's a genie, but it's a little bit different in a lot of mythologies, I believe. So in this one, it kind of feels like more of a ghost or more of a haunting, but it has an element, uh, some cool, you know, unique things in itself. Um, the location for the movie is great. It's terrifying. Um, I was catching myself being very angry for the uh, lead female in here, how she's treated and, oh, you know, the, the kind of society and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and, and with the buildings being blown to pieces, there's lots of good set set designs and stuff. And, and the movie, I think, did catch me catch me to jump a couple times. But it's basically a woman by herself uh, in this building trying to protect her daughter while her daughter is possibly starting to, you know, get very sick and hallucinate this ghost. But we all know better, right? It is a horror movie. Anyways, I thought it was a very interesting movie, a, a very interesting look at another country's uh, lifestyle at, the, at a certain time and everything like that. Um, just the small little details are really cool, how basically they can't watch VHS or it's contraband, so you can't have, like, she always Always works out to the Jane Fonda videotape and stuff, which I thought was really funny, but uh, she can't even have that. So it's just like, it's just an uh, awful existence, to be honest. But I, I thought it was a really solid movie that really works well, mixing the two, you know, real life, uh, grounded real life horrors with, you know, possible supernatural horror. So it's a good one under the shadow. Check it out. Okay, this is obviously my favorite movie of the week. Um, and this is a Patreon pick and it's by Jim Simon and he picked The Pit. Uh, what's it? Jamie wouldn't kill anyone unless Teddy told him to. Uh, yeah, this is based off a book. It's a Canucksploitation movie, Canadian exploitation film. Um, 
guess it's nothing like the book. Um, so that's very crazy. This is a super bizarre movie. I always had a, a love for it. Ever since the Anchor Bay DVD came out, I saw it fair, right when it came out. And I, I always thought it was super bizarre and weird and just not right. But it had such a weird bizarreness to it that I always loved. So this is 1981 film. Um, and it basically follows the character of Jamie. Um, who is a really bizarre kid. He's way too old to be acting the way he does. He carry, His only friend is Teddy. A teddy bear that he talks to. That talks back to him. Um, and there's this really weird moment halfway. About 30-40 minutes into the movie. Where you're like Teddy's in his head. Teddy's not real. There's no way. It's his, you know, his subconscious or whatever. And then the babysitter that is hired. Because basically the plot of this movie is. His parents are leaving. And they need to hire a babysitter to stay with him. For a few days or a few weeks. Or something along those lines. And he is a creepy perverse kid. Where a lot of the babysitters quit etc etc but he always talks to his teddy bear and one day the babysitter's cleaning the room and sets the teddy bear makes the bed and moves the teddy bear and sets him back and jamie's nowhere in sight jamie's nowhere around but nobody else is in the room too she's not the teddy bear moves its head and looks directly at the camera you're like so am i to understand this scare was for us this scare is real jamie's not seeing it himself so teddy has to be real which is not part of the book which is just like what in the hell are you doing? And I didn't even get to the main plot of this film. Basically what happens is Jamie finds this pit in the ground in the middle of the woods with, with troglodytes in them. The missing link. They're basically these small kind of cave dwelling things. Think from the time machine, right? And um, yeah, he starts to kind of talk to them because he has no friends. Um, he is uh, a, like doing weird, perverse things like doing these elaborate pranks to get a librarian nude so he could take pictures of her. Uh, has run-ins with his uh, babysitter's boyfriend, um, an old lady down the street, uh, a rude little girl. And he just does not get along with anyone. He's a miserable kid. He has this obsession with the babysitter. Um, and it's just really unpleasant in a lot of weird ways, but also goofy and insane in a lot of weird ways and i absolutely love it but it doesn't take long for just looking at the cover you pretty much know exactly what's going to happen um they don't eat chocolate bars um it's a great line i love it um and the end i've always adored the end of this movie i thought it was great and it's just such a weird just desserts kind of thing um it's just a, a crazy movie where it keeps getting weirder and weirder and you don't expect it to go to the place it does we're like oh it's just a tea seeing the um, troglodytes in the pit nothing's really gonna happen with them right uh, and then after a certain point you're like oh okay well i expected maybe that but then after after the end the climax you're like oh boy who really saw that coming um it just has a really weird charm to it too I, I really recommend checking out the pit there's some special features on here which i liked uh interview with the lead actor um and he talks about the movie and everything like that there's an interview with i think the guy who wrote the book and he's like they told me they made a piece of shit at least they were honest with it and uh, i think there's some another interview on here too um yeah there's an audio commentary with film historian jason uh Pikulski. um and there's an interview with star Jeannie Elias. And I watched all this stuff, the the composer and stuff, and I don't remember every single detail. I do remember the screenwriter popped out and the, the lead actor popped out. But anyways, I, I really re love this one. It's one of my favorite movies from 81. It's just bizarre, strange, and yet yeah, kind of goofy, but also just sleazy in an uncomfortable kind of way. So it's The Pit. I thought Kino did a great job with the, the print. It looked really good. Fortunately, no subtitles. That's my only knock on the release. Um, since I've been screwing up and not recommending a movie with this whole video. I knew I'd forget. I knew I'd forget right away. Maybe I'll put some cue cards or a little title up here. Goes good with or something like that. So anyways, The Pit, check it out. They eat meat. They don't eat chocolate bars, right? All right, we're here for Blind Spot. This is my pick. We had to do two picks in a row because I screwed up because I don't know what's going on anymore with my life. But this is The Innocence from 1961, directed by, is it, is it, uh, geez, Jack Clayton? I can't mistake his name. I want to say Jack Taylor, but I, I know him because he directed one of my favorite movies from the 80s that I used to watch all the time as a kid called Something Wicked This Way Comes. And they're both, this and that are classy, but classy in completely different ways. Yeah, I, like if you told me they're the same director, I'm like, no, they're not. That's bullshit. <laughs> like I literally, I was surprised. Every time I see it, I'm surprised. But like I said, The Innocence was directed in 1961. It's based off the Harry James story, uh, Turn of the Screw, which has been adapted 367,000 times. Um, the cinematographer is Freddie Francis from all the Hammer films and The Elephant Man. And he 
Cape Fear, the remake, and he directed a slew of good movies too, including um, Doctor and the Devils, and I, I think he was the one that actually directed Tales from the Crypt um, from 72, which I, I absolutely love. So, okay, um, I, I've always wanted to see this movie. I've always heard great things about it, and I felt like I knew the end. I felt like it was spoiled, but apparently um, there's a lot of different adaptations of this, and they are all a bit different. So, um, <laughs> it, it, it's definitely kind of like a psychological, uh, film, a ghost story, uh, a gothic story. Yeah. Uh, the plot is we have this, um, I don't even know how she's contacted, but she seems to be kind of a, a lady who's out on her luck and she's offered a job to watch these two children to be a, what, a governess of governess, this, this yeah. basically this beautiful mansion on this location, like this, it's big acres that they have everything you could ever want. And she's supposed to watch this young child um, kind of teach her, be motherly to her because their parents had passed away and the uncle wants absolutely nothing to do with them. He wants to go into town and get down and live his life. It's like a playboy. It's a like playboy, yeah. 1890. Yeah. So basically what happens is the young boy is off to school. He is basically expelled from school and sent home. So she has to take care of these two children who she believes, starts to believe are manipulative and she starts to uncover some dark truths about what happened to previous governors and housekeepers and all that kind of stuff. And you start to question what is really happening. Is there a haunting? Is there something insane? Is somebody lying? And that's pretty much it. Right. Um, she, ha she has this big, you know, like worry that like, like the children would become like corrupt or like somehow tainted. Um, and you find out that there was kind of like a, I don't know if you would say murder, suicide, or just there are two deaths of a couple um, in in the mansion, and yeah. it's kind of like everybody kept that information hidden from the children um, to help, you know, prevent them from. But they know these but, children yeah, know they, a lot they, more than they, they know, to and and the governess, you know, starts to believe that like like the the spirit of these two lovers have like somehow possessed the children. And which is an idea they use in a lot of films now, like the reincarnation oh, yeah. of someone being within someone. Mm -hmm. Well, they have the Japanese ghost story, which is a bit different than um, what she's skeleton key and even uh, spoiler. I probably shouldn't name any more of the newer movies that do it, huh? I mean, I think it, it is showing up a lot in newer movies. I, I don't want to spoil any, but there's right. a handful of newer films, arty horror films, that kind of have that reincarnation, but it's always kind of been done where you want the body. You know, right? But you know, in in this one, it's it's different because it's like the the few remaining like housekeepers that are there in the manor are like the 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 governess is like trying to, like wanting the children to like confess like this is the case that they're being possessed and and the govern the uh, main housemaid lady is like uh, I, I I think you're kind of wrong. She's like I mean, starting yeah, she's starting to slip. And she has these faces, like you're pointing out, like, do you see her face right there? Where right. she's just like, <gasps> when you're like, hmm. the, she's the, not right. Like, you know she's not right. Right. The main character, she she is a fantastic actress, but she expresses so much in her faces. Like, at the tail end of each scene, like, especially when she, like, she goes from, like, horrified to, like, reluctant smiling or laughing. Like, just as the scene fades, it's very subtle and very quick. And if you're, like, not paying attention, like... You know, you see it like this woman is like quickly losing her grip on reality, and and the the ending is so open ended that you don't really know. I I love the backhanded compliment the little boy gives her right when they meet. He's like, "You're far too pretty to be a governess," <laughs> and, you know, like, and she gets mad at first, but right. then she covers it like, "Oh," she's like. When she says something kind of like half rude response, and then she laughs it off and plays it mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, she's she's not right." Um. There's also the best part of the movie, besides you know the, uh, the cinematography. Oh yeah, cinematography. It's, it's probably the best. I mean, like I know that uh, Freddie Francis is a world renowned. He's like such a good cinematographer. But, like you start directing movies now, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, the black and white cinematography. Um, there's lots of like one takes, like one shots that are just perfect, falling around the house, and it's just, like, oh, this is just spectacular. And the and the way uh, Criterion fixed it up probably helps with it too. But I don't know. It's also a super awesome, beautiful location. It's vast. It's creepy. Um, it's really lovely, but also not homely. It's very hollow. Well, it's it's too in, big to be homely. Well, that's the thing. They're they're 
in, a in the opening opening parts of the movie, like everything's out in the open. It's a country manor. We have like like the sweeping landscape. Everything's well lit. It's daytime, and as the movie goes on, like they're inside more and it's darker and like the camera's more zoomed in on the character so you don't see like it's like it's like almost like like the world is like collapsing yeah. in on them um, claustrophobia and claustrophobia insanity, paranoia um the 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 governess she confronts the children you know each one on one to have them kind of like confess you know like 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 are you possessed by you know who, whichever one you're possessed by you know, and there's this, like, theme of, like, water um, with each of the confrontations. Like, when she confronts yeah. the, the little girl, they're, it's, like, downpouring at, at a, outside in the garden. And then when she confesses the, the little boy, it's they're in a greenhouse, and there's just, like, steam all up on the windows, and they're just, like, perspiring nonstop. Well, that also, um, it's, it's one of those story, movies where you're, like, did she learn about that person before she saw what she saw or right. she thought she saw? Like, did she see something that gave her the idea that that's what happened? So therefore then she imagined it or is it actually a haunting? It's very, very much open-ended in that way. And like, I thought that this one kind of veered from the original story and I, I never read the original story. Sorry, <laughs> I should have. <laughs> I mean, I probably will eventually, but I, I saw, I, I just went and skimmed the outline and I was like, no, Unless I was skimming the film outline, but I'm pretty sure I skimmed the, skimmed the outline, and it was very close to the the movie, the first movie. And I always thought that there was different twists, like the kids were been dead the whole time. I thought that literally was the twist. I, I thought, thought that they, would. I be thought they're both dead. Yeah, I thought. I thought that maybe the boy killed the girl, or the girl also seemed to have some sort of like psychic powers or like affinity to nature. I still think the boy might have killed the guy on the stairs or the woman. Right, I think. Well, I think he might have killed the guy on the stairs by accident. But the boy is clearly a psychopath. Um, he, that boy ain't right. Right, you know, like like he he comes close to stringing the governess while playing. He attacks his sister a lot. He was expelled for school for being. But I, also, you could play that off as just a, a bored, neglected kid. Yeah, it, it's hard to say. Um, you know, the movie is really open ending, and it, it does end in on kind of a shock to where like I'm not quite sure what happened. If that makes sense. Yeah, it was obviously not good, though. <laughs> right, yeah. No, no matter what, it wasn't good, but I, I just don't know what happened to who, um, if that makes sense. I don't want to give away the ending, because I really think you should watch I'm it. I'm sure a lot of people, most people have seen it. It's just like, this is a blind spot for a reason. It's, it's picking movies that we should have seen a long right. time ago. So, I, actually, this has been probably one of the most rewarding things we did so far. Yeah. All the movies that we watched at least were worth watching, except when you picked... Forbidden, which one is it? Forbidden World, not not no, the one with Leslie Nielsen. Forbidden Planet, the Corman one. I've seen that before, so I had to rewatch it. I was like, this does not belong on Blind Spot. Wait, Forbidden Planet? No, Forbidden World. Yeah, Forbidden World. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, Anne Francis is in Forbidden yeah, Planet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a Nielsen. masterpiece. That's a good one. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. Leslie Forbidden Nielsen World. was in that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, because he was the main love interest. Yeah. He's main character. So here we go. Uh, it's not in uh, Tear on Tape. It is yeah. probably going to be in John Stanley's Creature Features. It is. I'm Okay. It. So we have The Innocents. Uh, five out of five. 1961. Superior cinematic version of Henry James, The Turn of the Screw. Produced, directed, and unbearable tension by Jack Clayton. Scripted by Truman Capote and William Archibald. With insight in capturing the decay, depravity, and haunted possession which reek in the novel. Deborah Cure is a prim governess dispatched to a country mansion to tend the children of ice-cold Baron Michael Redgrave. Beneath the serenade exterior, serene exterior, sorry guys, and undercurrents of menace, menace are the children possessed by a former governess and the valet who were sadistic lovers before their deaths, or is it all in Kerr's imagination? Much of the horror is only suggested. One of the best ghost movies ever made. Martin Stevens, Pamela Franklin. Um, five out of five. I mean, it is probably the best shot movie we've seen. I would probably give it a five out of five, honestly. Yeah. I really liked it. I have to do it again. Um, I would watch it again. And I definitely, it's a shame. I'm looking at Jack Clayton's movies. He has a handful. But, like, I wonder if he probably was into something, like, producing or writing or something. But, I mean, Something Wicked This Way Comes is very special. And very different. Very different. Not even in the same world. Yeah, yeah I mean, no, that, they are completely different movies. Yeah, it's bizarre. That's kind of like when you think of Jack Bender, who directed Child's Play 3, 
And you're like, oh, what? And, I mean, they're not. You guys understand what I'm saying here. And then he also directed a Midnight Hour. It's like, yes, you can see it, but you can't. They yeah, don't feel anything alike. They mm-hmm. feel like two different worlds. Um, but anyways, I, I really like this one. I'll, I'll, I'll give it eight and a half out of ten. First time view. Really? It's objecti- objectively, it's a it's five out of five. But I'm just, first time, I, I have so much trouble giving a movie a perfect rating five out of five. I, I think, like, I gave Cool Hand Luke perfect and... Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Perfect. And bring me the head of Alfredo And basically five. nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I, I could easily give this one a five star. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's shot beautifully. I think that it's it's open-ended, but not like we didn't think the script thoroughly. On a, like, it's not like it's has loose ends because they didn't think of how to tie in loose ends. I think it's, it's open-ended for a reason yeah. and not so much to... Like our just, kind of lazy, we did sloppy. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's not perfect. a sloppy movie. It is a tight, well-written movie. Fantastically acted. Looks beautiful. The score is amazing. Rudda, stop it. Um, I, I I think it's perfect, and that's why I don't want to talk too much yeah. about the ending because it, if by chance you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth watching. It is in black and white, so don't even bring that up. <laughs> If people don't like watching black and white movies, burn out your eyes. Right. Um, I actually, I prefer black and white movies. Like I mean, more, especially when the, the cinematography is by Freddie Francis and right. looks that good. But um, you know what movie I think might be interesting for you to watch is mm. The Others. Have you seen The Others? Um, I think The Others is pretty much a remake of this movie in a lot of ways. Didn't they remake The Others? I think they were plant. Maybe they did, but I don't know. I feel like the remake shares. I mean, the others in general shares a lot of similarities to the Innocence or Turn the Screw. What's the one where they're wearing like little stupid masks and they're at a house outside and we're like, eh, they're gonna get you. The Strangers. It, yeah, maybe I've seen the Strangers. Why would I recommend the Strangers when I don't uh, know what the others is? I just the assume. others is a ghost story <laughs> with Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman. Yeah, but oh. I am your daughter. Do you remember that? I think, is that like early 2000s? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, 2001 or something like that. To one or two, I don't remember which. I vaguely remember watching it, but um, I'd never watch this one again. Yeah, probably me too. Yeah. But next week is your pick. It's your final pick. It is the classic George Romero movie, Martin, which I was like, you gotta see Martin, because I haven't seen Martin forever. I, Martin's a great movie. Romero's my favorite director, and you love Romero too. Mm-hmm. Is he your favorite horror director? No. Dor- Del Toro. Okay. Even though Pan's Labyrinth's not that scary. Yeah, shut up. That's the <laughs> We won't uh, go into it. That's an it. inside joke. <laughs> but George Romero's the best. I mean, sorry. Um, that's weird that you're just sub- objectively wrong about your opinion like that. Del Toro's the far <laughs> right, guys, director. Guys, I know Romero or Del Toro? Yeah, that's, Romero that's your Del question Toro. for next uh, week. No, Romero, no, Del Toro. But this is a bonus one. Romero, <clears throat> Del Toro. Who speaks to you more? A oh, who dead man? speaks to me more? Yeah, or a Spanish man. Aren't they both technically Spanish? Romero's Lithuanian and I think Mexican. And Del Toro's just uh, Mexican? I think Del Toro's Spanish. Is he Spanish? But he makes movies in Mexico, right? I thought that he was... He actually is Mexican, but he but made he a lot of his movies, movies in Spain. 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 Yeah. yeah, it's kind of strange that way. Yeah, he actually is Mexican. So, uh, yeah. Um... Next week, Martin, and Martin. then after that is the final movie, Thirst, by Park Chan-wook. And yeah. then we'll explain to you guys what we are planning on doing. We'll have to have some sort of end show, but it's going to be very difficult. We can't like rank them like we did the Hammer movies, because it's like I can't put the 26 movies that you have, you know what I mean, that you pick for your blind spot. I got present. a system you got, of how we can do this. You got no system. Yeah. Your um, system's not going to make any sense. You're my like, systems won't make sense. You just won't comprehend it. Because you are incapable of comprehending it. Also, so our last two movies, vampire movies. Yep. Because third sounds like a vampire movie. It is. And, oh, and I, and I this know this is the big boy. This is Claude. Yeah, this this is my my brother right here. Brother. We need don't we need a feline representation? <laughs> if I could say it. <laughs> Get out of here, brother. All right, so we're done. All right, bye. Okay, guys. Uh, getting to these questions, answers, and comments. Ben Grimm. Uh, White Noise reminds me of the old sighting show on Fox about a guy seeing his deceased kid in a TV static. Gave me the creeps back then. I love those old like anthology shows. Uh, there was one called Night Terrors too. We everybody remembers like the big ones, but I some of the smaller ones I remember seeing shows, but can't remember every one of them. Ken Coakley, the this is regarding Carnival of Souls. I worked at West Coast Video from 1997 to 99. Uh, we had great old horror movies. As a recent manager, was a horror fan. Sometimes I would play Carnival of Souls. Customers would tell me that the music alone was giving them the creeps. The manager told 
them told me that the customers had complained because the music was really creeping them out. <laughs> uh, I kid reincarnation is a great horror movie. One of my, my, uh, one of my favorite Japanese films, Mandy Cage. I also saw Night of Living Dead around the same age, too. So same age. Too young. It's my favorite of the series. Good shit. I love Night of Living Dead. Dr. Snuff, I completely agree with you what you said about Cursed. It's not as bad as people say it is. I love the part in the end where the werewolf flips the middle finger. It gets a laugh from me, too. Ken Coakley, I would like to hear a commentary on a lot of the movies. Because question of the week, I asked, what movie would you like to hear me do a commentary on? Ken Coakley, I would love to hear a commentary on movies such as George Romero's Dead Trilogy. We did Dawn and Day, uh, Hell of the Living Dead, uh, The Beyond, House by the Cemetery. Love to do those. David Luton, awesome video as always. Brilliant blind spot this week. Really enjoyed your guys' takes on cat people. Travis Wright, Curse sounds awesome. A commentary with Jeremy on Rocky Horror would probably be a lot of fun. Coco Loco, I'd love to hear a commentary on a really wild movie you haven't seen yourself yet. Either something absolutely terrible or something that knocks you out with a twist. I can recommend Real by Slasher Victim 666. Either way. Would love to hear your opinion on it. Free and legal on Vimeo. Thank you. Uh, David Leather, another great shoe. <laughs> How about Bride of Frank commentary? Question mark. Thank you. Peek and Boo. Oh, this is very long, but I'm going to read it anyways because we don't have that much. Okay, so... Um, Peek and Boo. Hey, I have seen that guy in Beach Babes from, Outer, from Beyond in another movie. He was in I Want to Play Games starring Lisa Boyle. The 90s had some really great looking babes in their softcore erotic thriller films. Sad to hear that the audio on Naked Girl Murdered in the Park has such bad sound. Almost my death myself. Hope your hearing is better now. I remember you spoke about having or suspected you had tin tinnitus a while back. No, I still have it in the left ear, but uh, I deal with it. Glad you liked reincarnation. There's a hidden symbolism there with the red shoes. It's a popular story in a way in a Japanese horror. The story comes from a nursery rhyme from 1922 where a mother loses her young daughter. The daughter had red shoes on at the moment. So the mother cries every time she sees red shoes. It's based on a real life event. Um, Aizwaspigi, Kimi, a young orphan girl from uh, Fushimi who was given up for adoption due to hardships. Then they have uh, added ogre, a troll-like kind of being, into stories. And since the most popular color for an ogre is red, you have a story about ogres kidnapping or haunting young children. There's a South Korean horror film from 2005 called Red Shoes that, although I haven't seen, it deals more on the Red Shoes story that I tried to explain. Yeah, I, I have that movie. I've not had a chance to watch it. Um, there is a two-part TV movie who becomes so popular that he made it to full-length movie and sequels. And even did the U.S. Oh, sorry. That's uh, missed the wrong line. I need to rewatch Reincarnation since it's been years, and you should try to watch The Grudge. It originally was a two-part TV movie who beca became so popular that... It was made in a full-length movie and sequels, and even did the U.S. remakes. Question of the week. Young Guns would be interesting. Great update as always. Be safe. By the way, if you're going by the original story by H.P. Lovecraft, Cthulhu had been sleeping for eons. Don't know how long that is, and you suddenly awakened by some men on a boat. Anyone would be a bit grumpy. Poor Octoman never had a chance. Gojira is original building uh, hugger. A loose reference to tree huggers. Uh, three huggers, but he said tree. Or three. I think it's supposed to be tree. Don't blame him for the poor construction since he only wanted to hug the buildings. Gojira may be offended and that is not a good idea. Love the Cannibal Holocaust segment in your answer section. I for one burst out laughing. Sorry for the long text. That's all right. Nick Mua. I think I enjoy any film you chose to do a commentary for, Dave. For all your film knowledge alone, if I had to pick something, I'd go in with Escape from L.A. John Carpenter at his worst, I know, but I bet it's still better than other so-called directors at their best. I don't know if you love or hate the, this film, but hearing your thoughts either way, you'd be interesting. Also, the 2014 Belgium slasher Cub. It homages a few U.S. slashers for sure. I'd love to hear you discuss that at length. What works and what doesn't. The Carpenter S score, the lighting. Questions. I read 1984 some time ago. Do you feel that we are increasingly living in a Big Brother controlled society? I think that a lot of people worry about it while they pick up their cell phones and tell everybody where they're at anyway. So, hey, it's something I can't do anything about, right? I'm not going to worry about it. I can't. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, the Internet. In fact, we're doing it to ourselves. I mean, uh, we're constantly getting bombarded with ads and stuff like that. And that's the funny thing is everything. They're going to steal our identity. They're going to know what we're doing. And it's like they're just using it just to sell us crap. Like, that's basically the, that's the, the, the bottom dollar. The bottom line is that they want your money. Um what are some of your favorite tyrannical government movies? Off the top of my head, we'll go zero population growth, I think, is interesting enough. And, um, yeah, that, that's the one that comes to my mind that I watched recently. And THX. Let's go THX is really good. Um, 
Um, have you seen the movie, the zombie movie, The Girl with All the Gifts? If so, your thoughts on it? I actually covered that one. I enjoy it. I think it's a pretty good movie. Love Patty Constantine. Good, good take, a uh, different take on the zombie genre. A Coop 37, forget all about Cursed, may have to revisit it. Isamisio, you should do a commentary for The Visible Man 2020. Kidding, of course, but that would be funny. Listen, just straight up verbal annihilation for two hours. I don't hate the movie that bad. I think it's a good movie. I just don't like it. White Noise, I really wasn't a fan of. Agree Dead Silence is a good one film that got steamrolled by Saw and all those other films. Cat People is an odd one. I have seen, re- I haven't seen Reincarnate. I have seen Reincarnation, but I don't remember it much. Probably do for a revisit. I'm curious about The Reckoning. Strange it had such a quiet release guess it probably isn't that good nice update as always thank you travis lipscomb mood struck is sharon nick cage might sound bad but i swear it's a great movie it has a criterion i i knew that mistake right when i made it when i said it oh i kind of editing i was like duh uh 81 oak ridge saw three is the goriest mainly because the director is trying to top hostile which was never accomplished i'm more of a fan of the first two hostile movies than any of the saw sequels darren lynn bowsman did a direct directed the mother's day remake which i thought was pretty solid i thought it was well directed but poorly written it's like it's i always felt that movie was like to tell you it's like human society is trash humans are horrible now watch every human act like an alien and not act anything human so it's just like yeah humans can suck but why don't you portray humans as humans and not aliens um slipknot boy 555 uh he 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 marks the timestamp for when i got cladiston uh there it is i'm not saying it anymore uh right the first time and then he he timestamps when i screw up representation <laughs> salvador funkenstein uh return of the living dead rave to the grave kidding but i don't know something fun and ridiculous nightmare city cannibal apocalypse burial ground uh dustin mills or anyone you've been dying to do something with again that would be awesome. Keith uh, Boyd Jr., RoboCop. Jeremy R., ironically, I know, because originally Keith misspelled uh, RoboCop, but he put like Rocopco and, or Rococo, and it was funny. Jeremy commented, ironically enough, I could talk for hours on the Rococo movement. Uh, Peter England, your favorite movie, of course, Day of the Dead, Return of the Dead, Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, Addison Heath, Chocolate, Strawberry, Vanilla. Tony, Mr. Tony the Dead agrees. Kelly Casson, uh, Countryman. How about revenge movie? It would be nice to have a guest that did have any kind of real life experience based in a movie. At least I did, and I have some friends that have too. That would be interesting. Um, Neil Lemoy, hashtag Band Merriman. I will. If you make the movie Band Merriman, I will do a commentary on it. Ron Munster, Young Guns, please. Skip Barber, a segment of what makes for a bad movie, setting elements for truly horrible movies. Uh, I think this is an old answer. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, I, I would want to do that because I hate focusing on negative. Like, if I don't like a movie, I try to get it over and done with. I do rant sometimes. That's why I try to avoid any negatives because you sound like an asshole. Skip Barber, uh, he basically also mentions uh, he wanted me to do maybe something about a segment on FX practical effects and not CG. This is an old answer. I would, but I would be worried about fighting the clips and the algorithm on YouTube. I can, I can try to do something like that. Justin Patrick, ghoulies go to university. Uh, okay, Sam Edwards just uh, answers Ghoulies do Dallas. Uh, Joe Kim Johannesson, Texas Chainsaw 2. Dave the Lu- uh, Luton, the Rocky Horror Picture Shore for Jeremy to guest is obvious reasons. And Chud 2 for Dave to really get stuck into. I would just sing along the whole time. I'd be like, I'm a walk in. Uh, Daniel Rice, are you talking about your channel or commentary with Jeremy or 22 Shots? Either one, I would love to hear about your thoughts on particular Asian fantasy films. I absolutely adore them. They are so weird and bonkers. He says the Monkey King films and the Legend of uh, Nega Pearls. So I guess the question of the week, since we covered the pit this week, I want to know your favorite Canuxploitation movie. What is it? Is it, uh, I, I mean, the pit's probably my favorite, but there's a lot of them. I, does Cronenberg count as exploitation in the beginning? I think early it does. Maybe My Bloody Valentine. Let's hear them. There's lots of William Fruit. He did a bunch of movies too. So there's a lot of them. So look it up. Also, if you want to stick around, um, basically we're going to hop into the update, but stick around for the Jay Wolfel interview. It's an hour and like 27 minutes. I interview Jay Wolfel. We kind of bullshit. He uh, talks about the new release of Beyond Dreams Door coming out. And uh, Dr- he talks about the film Beyond Dreams Door, some other things, Ghost Lake. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a director. He did a bunch of movies. He directed The Things from 1993, Beyond Dreams Door. Um, he's still working in film. He's done a bunch of stuff. Uh, it's a pretty cool interview. Hopefully it turned out all right. We did it on Zoom. So the timing sometimes is messed up. Sound is not the best, but I think it's decent. I think it's, it's listenable for sure. Um, Let me know what you think, and that will be popping up at the very end of the video. But for now, let's hop into the update. Okay, this is going to be a fairly quick update. First up, 
is 29 Needles. Too extreme for the mainstream on Earth films. Um, this movie sounded insane. And I'm actually, for a first time in a long time, a little apprehensive about watching it. But yeah, it's supposed to be really crazy. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into. It came with a poster. Not going to open up the poster because it looks just like the... I guess I am opening it up, alright? It looks just like the uh, case. So we also have... Himitsu, which is a Scion Sono movie. Um, it's out of print, I think. It was kind of expensive, but I was worried about not being able to get it. Um, I know that UK had a release that was uh, out of stock at the time when I went to order from Arrow. But yeah, this is uh, from Ala Films. I like his movies. It's one I did not have. So, And last, of course, The Dungeon of Andy Milligan with all these movies on here. The, it says including, but there's a lot more. So yeah, from Severin. This is a pretty heavy box. You can hear that. I know people like to hear that. That's like going to be a new internet thing of people just knocking on hard box case for DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff. Yeah, so it's got a bunch of movies on here. You know, I'm not really familiar with Andy Milligan. I have bought some of his movies, but super happy to have this nice, awesome box set. Very cool. Going to sit next to the Chris Release set when it shows up. And, of course, the Al Adamson one. So, uh, yeah, back to the video. Sorry for the short update. Uh, yeah, but it is what it is. Can't buy everything all the time. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. So I'm Mr. Parker, and I'm here with Jay Wolfel. We're going to talk a little bit about some of his movies, some of his uh, inspirations and all that kind of jazz, and just let the conversation take us wherever it goes, right? Hope so. <laughs> I, I am Jay Wolfel. I'm the writer, director, composer, occasional editor, depending on which uh, credit of mine you look up. But uh, I'm, I'm a filmmaker type. How's that? Yeah, that's good because a lot of those people are just strictly directors or writers. But the filmmaker title, I would say, is for somebody like a, a George Romero that does his own editing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, Romero, of course, came from Pennsylvania. I came from Ohio originally. Uh, I don't know if it's as true today as it was back then. But back then, if you wanted to make movies and you weren't in Los Angeles, you had to pretty much do it all yourself. You could get some friends who would help you out. But so you end up learning how to do a little bit of everything if you want to do anything, because there's no, you know, it's 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 a hobby, if even that, you know. So that's, I learned all that stuff because that was the only way I could make films. It's not that I think I should do them all at once. Yeah. I do think it's a good idea if you know all those things, because when you're making a movie with other people, which is most of the time, um, you need to understand what it's like to walk in their shoes you know, how to talk to them. Hopefully you can communicate better with somebody who's edited because you've edited, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a value that way. I don't think it's something you should do everything at the same time. I've been a silent or co-producer on movies, but I've never really taken producer credit. I usually don't do that. That's a job which is all encompassing during production. And I don't think a producer director, I think, you're dividing your loyalties kind of badly. Yeah. I've asked, I've asked producer directors, you know, everybody, you know, first time I met Robert Wise uh, at a US, uh, USC conference, I asked him, was there any difference between when you were just a director or when you eventually transitioned into being a producer director from the way you looked at films you made? And he was like, no, he goes, I was pretty much doing all the producing work anyway, by that point. So I figured I might as well just produce it myself. But, uh, to disagree with him, which is probably foolish, I always kind of feel like when you become a producer director, and this part like Lucas, all the you know Spielberg, I think your agenda is a little different. So I've always tried to have a separate producer because it's not a job I think you can do and fully concentrate on uh, directing a movie. It's it's you know they're they're both more than 100 percent of your time jobs, but you could edit and direct because you're really editing after you've already directed. Yeah. Or music, you know, these are not. You can only juggle so much stuff at, at a time. Of course, you you're better to be around too if you're editing it, right? Right, right. And I, for most of my features, I've not been my own editor. And people have asked me, "Well, you edit other people's movies? Why don't you edit your own?" It's like, well, I don't want to be alone in a room with myself. You know, you need that other, you know, another set of ears. I've gotten better at that over time. But I used to get that question all the time. It's like, well, you had it for other people. Why don't you had it for yourself? And that was the answer is because I, you know, I don't want to be stuck with my own ideas. You go down, you focus on the wrong things or you just kind of burn yourself out. There's nobody to yell at but yourself, you know. Yeah. I hope I've never yelled, I hope I've never yelled at editors. Usually you're editing, you're yelling at your equipment.
Well, you can always make adjustments to the editor too. If you're watching the footage, you know, if you're, if you're so into it, you don't know what to cut or not. Right. If you're so close to the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to, and especially in a crew position, because your continuity people and your actors and even your DPs or your assistant camera people will be all freaked out about getting some part of the shot wrong and you're moving on and they want to redo it for a reason that doesn't matter because the way the coverage is, you don't need that bad part of the shot, but people are worried about their bad work being exposed. So that's some kind of trust. And sometimes you just have to kind of force that on a crew person. It's like, you're just gonna have to believe me. I know you made a mistake on the last one, but where you messed up is good on a previous take and we're going to edit it. And, you know, we, we got to move on and it's not because I'm going to show off you being bad. It's because we've got it. You know, if you don't use every take yeah. part of every take, why did you do, if you do five takes and you just use all of one, unless it's a one shot thing where the whole scene is just that, you know, that's the thing with film. And I found working with editors sometimes is they find the first good take and they'll just use that for the whole scene. It's like, no, 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 that's not really what's intended. You know, use yeah. the other coverage. Um, Cause it's bits and pieces, you know, which are stitched together. So each each bit is is not going to stand alone. It's going to be edited in with other material. I was going to ask, because you started early in the probably the late 70s, probably starting with like uh, films on your own. I know you probably were working a lot with film and stuff back then. So I was wondering, were you one of the, you know, they always have those kids that are making the movies and everything like that, super young. And I know that you went to film school and the original Beyond Dreams Door came out in 83. So, right. It was done as a short. Yeah, I, I started when I was, I, I, you know, when I was little, I like played with GI Joes and built lots of models and had model train sets and all this kind of stuff. And you sort of you outgrow all that eventually. Uh, that I think is kind of a good precursor to doing film. So some of my early films, I basically took some of the sets and things I had constructed and turned them into stop motion animation movies. So the first films I started doing were stop motion animation. I did a two James Bond uh, sort of parody movies that I should put out on YouTube. They're both quite elaborate. One, they're each 45 minutes long and they both took me a long, long time to do. And really by doing those is what got me into film school because I showed those to um, a family friend who was a professor at Ohio State and he saw one of those films and thought that I should be a production designer because I did this James Bond parody. So I had all these elaborate little sets I built and stuff. I just did that again because I had to. But he didn't really tell me that because you have enough talent that you should like, you know, do this for a living. And that was kind of news to me. Uh, so that it, it kind of led into there. But it, it started with model trains and building stuff. And of course, you create your own little scenarios with soldiers and all this kind of thing. And and uh, so, yeah, I, I started out using the old eight millimeter camera my father had. And that camera was half broken as it turned out. So then I got a Super 8 camera. I never had Super 8 sound. So the first sound stuff I did was on video and in film school because I had no access to, to that. So my first movies were silent films with, with title cards and you know all that stuff. It was all 8 millimeter, not Super 8, right? But, well, the first one was 8 and then the rest were all Super 8 until I, until I got into film school. The cool thing about doing it with the miniatures is you really don't have a scale. You know, the ambition is as much as you want to make it so you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Do you have any like do you have any quick inspirations? I imagine with the stop motion stuff, you probably watched a lot of Ray, Ray uh, Harryhausen and stuff like that a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah. Um, you know, as a little kid, I always woke up early, which I don't have a problem with anymore. But uh, I wake up early and you'd watch like Gumby and, you know, there used, to, there used to be lots of like stop motion animation. There is now again, too, because kids will do stop motion animation on their phones. They figure out how to do that feature. Um, it's a cool, it's a cool thing to do. And yeah, the actors will stand around as long as you want. They'll also fall over and they won't do anything on their own. But um, yeah, you could start shooting a scene and come back the next day and keep going. But yeah, Jason and the Argonauts uh, was probably the first Harry Housing film I saw. Valley of the Guanji, which I think doesn't get as much uh, credit as it should. I saw these in like junior high. They used to show movies at lunchtime. So sometimes I'd go play football. And then when the weather was bad, you'd start watching movies for a quarter. You'd see one in a, in a week. They'd show you in you know, 20 minute chunks, 16 prints. So when you did the um, old uh, movies, did you actually go over with the ones without sound and dub them over at all? I haven't. I should do that too. I was going to um, ask never who played that. James Bond, who was the voice of James yeah. Bond. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I did a little bit of voiceover to introduce 
Um, I think both of those have voiceover right at the beginning. But no, if I would redo them, and I could take the faces and sort of animate the lips moving a little yeah. bit. There's an actor named Robert Donovan who did a James Bond uh, parody for a friend of mine, Rolf Kanaski. And uh, he, when I saw his taperage, I thought he was the perfect sort of mix of Roger Moore and Sean Conray, which at the time were the only two Bonds, except for Lazenby, who nobody wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would probably still use him because he's got this perfect kind of hybrid, you know, he sounds like Bond, but not necessarily a specific one. Um, but yeah, I thought it'd, it'd just be a big, it'd be a big project. And I'd have to do all the music because it was all just John Barry and, you know, just stuff I oh, stole yeah. at the time. So that it'd be a big job. I should do it. They were elaborate, very elaborate things. One is James Bond versus the neo-Nazis where he found like frozen Nazis in South America. And the other one deals with basically a sort of Princess Diana who gets kidnapped by this guy who's going to have a baby with her unless they pay the ransom. So that's the whole, that was called Ransom for Love, which I still think is a good premise. You can kidnap a royal woman and, you know, so then Bond can't, can't really have a relationship with her either. And so those were my two. I started out making them as sort of parodies, but by the time I got halfway into the second one, I was a total Bond freak. And so, so the first one's they, a precursor of Lethal Weapon 2 then, right? <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> true, yes, yes. Diplomatic immunity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so <laughs> did you prefer do you prefer film? I imagine a lot of the older people that have been doing it. No offense. I mean, like the people that have been doing it for a very yeah. long time that worked on film are always like, I miss the miss the film. Uh, yes and no. Um, the thing was when I when I got it when I was starting to go through film school in the 80s, um, there was a teacher who was using video as a way to basically do film, which was considered, you know sort of verboten, you know, but the audio was far easier and the cameras were quiet and it was a lot cheaper and uh, you could shoot more and all this kind of stuff. But so in film school, you're always like, ah, video, this looks like a soap opera. I hate it. I hate it. And then you finally get to make a movie if you have money or whatever, which I did do um, uh, 30, uh, 16 millimeter um, film films eventually in film school. Um, and then, you know, I come to Los Angeles and as the years go by, everybody gets all excited about HD and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, man, now we're back to video, which I was stuck with when I first started film school. They're like, oh, video, it's the next thing. Let's do video. And so to see all these people I admired, like trying to sell me on how great video was, it gets HD, but it's still video. Um, but I, I mean, sadly, now film is really dead. People are like, well, but, you know, Quentin Tarantino, it's like. The yeah, film industry will not be supported by a guy who makes one movie every three or four years. And this is not, yeah, this is not the industry. I mean, it's cool that he still does that, and some people can still are able to do film, but film is really dead as a as a as an industry. You know, the few directors who shoot film, you know, they they even though their movies make money, it's such a fraction of everything. And with effects being so computer and video dominant they're really better off dealing with video to begin with essentially yeah. so you know i love film uh my last my last and newest feature asylum of darkness was shot all on film 35 film finished on film to have a film print and we made a um an inner positive from the negative so we could make the prints from an actual film element the other thing about films now is that for years film basically becomes video immediately. They transfer it and they do digital color correction and all this kind of stuff. So what film really was has been so buried in digital stuff anyway that by the time now where mostly there is no film to begin with, the difference between the two has become very minuscule. Yeah, I can understand that. Although I will say this, I do say a bad movie on film it's better than a bad movie on digital. I always say that <laughs> like, I, like you catch yourself watching like HD Lewis movies and you're like, I, this is, I don't like this, but I'm going to watch the whole thing. I don't know why. Maybe it's the film. I don't know. Could be, you know, Roger, you had the whole theory that, you know, the 24 frames a second thing was a big factor in terms of film being, I mean, literally film does hypnotize you. You know, you forget about other things you concentrate and focus on. And he, Ebert was convinced that that, the big problem was changing the frame rates that that with the video because it wasn't frames although that's not necessarily true anymore that that was a big sort of somatic element to film um and it really is hip, hip, hypnosis but i think you do that if you're if you're interested in the subject matter anyway but yeah there i mean there is a difference there used to be a wide difference obviously video was crappy let's face it oh, the yeah. resolution poor the colors were, were very limited and kind of weird people would look odd 
fish color flesh tones and stuff so yeah early on it was particularly appalling <laughs> video. and i feel bad for a lot of the movies that you like on video that you're like this is never going to look great because it was even that even the time in the early digital like if, like i always use 28 days later as an example i know they did the weird frame rates and special but that's like this is a great movie that looks like crap and it's always going to look like crap <laughs> and i i'm like but oh well you know what it is what it is have you seen Apocalypto lately? Because, you know, that was an early big feature, which was all, although somebody told me later, like some of that was actually shot on film. But I remember seeing that in a theater and some of the shots, I was like, oh, this is going to, this is all, this is all the better it's ever going to look, you know, because there is no higher resolution master. Oh, and some wow. of it looked quite good, but I just wonder, I haven't seen it lately to, to see if I would just be kind of taken out of it by the way it looks. Because 28 days later, they were kind of like, well, it has a little bit of that kind of live video vibe. Yeah. I remember working with this guy who was going to produce my first feature and he never did, but he had some like sort of bootleg videos and stuff. And he had the Beatles on like some Ed Sullivan or something like that. And it was a really nice copy. It was black and white video. And we were just both watching it for a couple of seconds. He goes, you know what? He goes, it seems like they're playing right now. You know, it's got this live quality. Yeah. It's not, you know, film has got a sort of, and that feel, uh, can work for some things like in 28 days. Yeah. Um, the fact that it felt live and real, they didn't go Blair witchy with it in terms of being shot badly or, yeah. or being presented as video, but it still had that video feel that it somehow helped it a little bit. Again, yeah. now that everything's kind of that way, if you put it up against something else, it might just be distractingly, you know, poor looking. That's the thing is you don't want to be distractingly video looking. If it's going to look like video, it should lend itself to you know that's why Blair Witch and Paranoid Activity worked because the fact that they felt like video helped sell the story you know so yeah, you could exactly. get into it you know and then of course everybody just started jumping on it and doing that but there's a lot of those so. A, there's so many now that I don't know that, but, um, but yeah well they're harder to do good than people think they are so they're just like uh you know what I mean so like I know that Fred Vogel said that he was like, I know people will look at August underground. And they're like, they didn't even try on this. This is junk. He's like, I carried that guy up the stairs in one shot. We didn't cut. I carried two of these like 300 pound guys up the stairs. And everybody tells me I'm not even trying. He's like, you guys couldn't do that. You know, that kind of thing. It's like, we planned it. It wasn't just that sloppy as it looks. We actually tried to make it look like that. So, but um, I guess we're talking about film and video. We'll hop into your first feature, which was shot on film, right? Uh, Beyond dreams door from 1980. Yeah. Yeah, we shot it in 88. Um, yeah, that was one where certainly we had been shooting on video and we couldn't afford to do 35. We thought we could and then our investors fell through and we ended up making the movie for what we had kind of left over. Um, but I personally and Scott and Dirk, you know, the, the producer and DP, us being the sort of core, uh, we, I, I especially wanted to spend the extra money and shoot on film. Because I felt if anybody ever wanted to make a print one day, they could actually make a print, even though it would be from 16 negative. I didn't know HD was coming, but I knew that that would be a better, yeah. longer lasting master format. Now we transferred it to video and cut it all on video. And then of course, some, I think IMDB might list it as being video, which galls me because it doesn't look like video, I don't think. And we went to a lot of trouble to shoot on film and then transfer from the negative, we had to go down, the final color correction is basically what we did the first transfer. So we had to go down and time every shot, you know, as we were shooting to edit it. Um, so there was no color correction done later either. You couldn't really do that, at least not the facilities we were using. Yeah, yeah we really specifically shot on film and it was a big extra expense to do that. Oh, I bet. We wanted that, we wanted that film feel and the opening credits were shot on them. Um, film also so that because at the time video credits were really terrible you know you'd rent something you'd put it in if it had video titles you're always like oh man <laughs> and it always have the video same video kind of music video. too you knew exactly yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. like oh shit right away you're like oh, oh even though of course that's what you're making yourself is on video but still it's like so um and one of the things we actually did with the vinegar syndrome did with this new release was um the end titles are actually done in a way that they match the opening film titles so yeah. we don't have these kind of clunky video titles at the end of the movie anymore which was great to finally get rid of you mentioned that a lot of people said it was uh they thought it was sov 
there are so many movies that you used to look up early days of the internet as the best SOV movies. And they'd have like half of them were an SOV. They were shot on film and then edited on tape. There's so many of those like mutilations, truth or dare. People thought the video dead was SOV when it's clearly not SOV because it said the video dead. <laughs> yeah. When I found, I found, I hadn't seen that movie till recently. And I just assumed it was shot on video. I was like, this is not video. Yeah. Anything which rele- what got released on video, they would just call video. And so then yeah. you would assume or they assumed it was shot on video. It's like, no, it was posted and released on video. Which again, now everything is, everything's just digital file. You know, yeah. No prints in it. Well, video but violence yeah, was it, actually on video. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the guy from um, San Diego was interviewing me about SOV movies. I was like, you realize that I think I only really made one, discounting the HD movies, yeah. which I've now done in the real back in the day, because Beyond Your Door was on film. And most of the things, you know, I, in terms of director, I was usually on film. So Things would have been your only SOV, right? Things? Yeah, at the time. Yeah, yep, Things. That was the first feature I was involved with when I moved to LA. It was an anthology, which I rewrote the one episode i was doing and then helped figure out how to it was originally supposed to have an extra episode okay. um which they then got rid of so the wraparound which everybody wanted to reshoot but nobody wanted to pay to reshoot um had to be, then be like re-edited a little bit to like flow into into a third you know third story because there was an extra bit of um of interstitial material which got dropped so i helped kind of figure out that and I was there to kind of make everybody like each other again because the original production team had kind of fallen apart. So I was the new guy who was brought in to kind of be excited about finishing this movie. They'd shot the first episode and all the wraparound and like a year had gone by. Um, and then Sterling got me involved and that's how that happened. But yeah, that was the first video feature I was involved with. Somebody told me, well, I didn't tell me, I heard it on a podcast, which is a very funny story that directly involves you. Um, it was oh, Ill- it was either Killer POV or Shockwaves, and it was a guy called Elric Kane. He's a host of the show. I always listen to the show. So they did a screening of, um, or they brought up things, but they were talking about the Barry Gillis starring things, and they said something about that. And then he mentioned that if you want to, he said, I directed things. He's like, well, I directed things. He said, what are the odds of both people that directed the movie called Things being in the, in the it was a Jump Cut Cafe, right? So were you at the Jump Cut Cafe when they were showing that? Um, no, no, were that's in L.A. Okay heard about this okay yeah i um yeah there was the other things that i had never seen or heard of i'd seen a little a flyer for it someplace and then one day like years later it's jump cut cafe i was there and um and with barry right i think his name is the producer oh it's barry Barry? something barry gillis i think I think Barry Gillis yeah Yeah. i was gonna say Jamie Gillis at least but uh, (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) not the same (laughs) Yeah, yeah, since we're talking about, since there's a porn actress in the other things. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were at that place uh, for a screening and uh, somebody was talking up front. It was Brad Sykes, actually. And they're like, by the way, something sort of, something, you know, he didn't say significant, but he goes, both of the people who worked on the two different things movies are sitting right next to each other. So that's how I finally met him. We were just sitting there, you know, we'd come to see another movie. We weren't showing either of those things, movies. Um, yeah, and he'd heard of mine and I'd heard of his. Uh, there was a screening at the uh, at the Egyptian uh, and they had things on listed as, as showing. And people showed up there and it was not the things that I'm involved with. It was his things. I guess some of the audience was kind of angry because they came for one things and it was the other things movie. I actually contacted the Egyptian and I said, by the way, I was like, if you're showing my movie, great. <laughs> I'll happily come down. But if you're not, you've got me listed for somebody else's movie. And, you know, I don't want to take credit for his movie and he doesn't want, you know, oh, vice yeah. versa. But yeah, then we met each other at that Jump Cup Cafe going to a screening of an entirely different film. And I've still never seen that. There's also the, there's one of these shot on video um, uh, movies you know there's several movies just about fans of shot on video and there's this whole section where the guy has both things on his wall he's going okay i have there's three things here he goes but these are two different things although this things is this thing but that thing is a different thing so these things are by the same director and that thing's by a whole different so it's like an abbott and costello routine you know it's like an italian horror film uh like one of those series or something this zombie and this is also zombie three and this one also yes. zombie three yes, but yes. not really yeah 
Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Yours has a franchise though, right? There's like five of them now. You were talking, you know, talking about SOVs. Like when we were doing those, of course, some people working on them were again, this is video, all these are crud. Who is there an audience for these? Will ever anybody ever remember these shot on video movies? Because that was the whole thing, you know, thing. Uh, and yeah, there is. There's now a, a very specific fan base for shot on video features. But when we were doing that, it's like, oh, is you know, are these going to become the, the you know, Republic serials or whatever that people give a damn about in, in a few years. And yes, they, yes, they are. And yes, they will. So before we get into Beyond Dreams door, I basically want to make a statement here. Like, of course, when you see a movie 1989, it involves dreams. There's a major difference between Nightmare on Elm Street and Beyond Dreams door, because in Nightmare on Elm Street, you're entering a dangerous dream world and Beyond Dreams door, the dangerous dream world is coming into the real world. So it's, it's like the opposite. Plus you said the original was made in 83. So not really much to compare except dream stuff, which is very broad and for horror movies in general anyways, right? I think where that, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, you know, there's all, there's dream scenes in lots of horror movies. Um, and there are probably either even other, other movies that are just, you know, where it's all just a dream kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Beyond Your Door was done as a short first for one of these video production classes. They did these summer group classes at Ohio State. Uh, there were 20 minute movies. And so um, I, I took the class one summer. Of course, I thought I'd get to write and direct and I didn't because I was new to doing that. I ended up doing sound on a movie, but I met some good friends who ended up, and actors too, who ended up crossing over with me. So the second year I took the class, the beginning of the class, you'd write a script to be done as a 20 minute thing. And so um, I had taken another video class before that, which I made this very kind of artsy sort of nightmare dream sequence, which is actually in the feature. And then when I got my chance to do a 20 minute movie, I then had Beyond Dream's Door. And my whole thing was dream movies. I didn't like it when they woke up and it was just all a dream oh, yeah. or, the, or the point that that, that 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 was somehow comforting or there was some difference between the two. So my interest was in doing a thing where there was no difference between the dream world and the so-called real world. It was all equally real. So the movie, neither movie was ever about waking up or trying to figure out what a dream is and what a dream isn't. When Cine Fantastique, uh, which was a, a big magazine, they were the first big magazine to cover Beyond Dreams Door. Um, I talked to the, the writer of that piece, called me up, and it's like I was given a bunch of smaller movies, and frankly, I hated most of them, but I liked yours, and so I want to talk to you, and I became good friends with him. John Thonin was his name. Um, that when, the, when the magazine was published, the headline on the, on the article was like something like... Um, like Nightmare on Elm Street ripoff makes for good movie or something. And he apologized to me. He goes, that was not the title of the article I wrote. That's not the way I look at your movie. But that I think has cemented that in a lot of people's, you know, people who then talk about the movie because they look up what's previously been written or said about it. And so, yeah, it's about nightmares. The thing my way of, of looking at it was like, by the time we were looking to do a feature, because we'd done all these shorts in film school, we wanted to do a feature before we all went off into the real world and did whatever made industrials or whatever we were going to do, which was a really smart decision to make a feature. I didn't realize how smart a one at the time. Um, by that point, Nightmare on Elm Street had come out, the feature. So now if you did a movie where you were dealing with dreams and what's real and what is it, that was a commercial idea thanks to Nightmare on Elm Street already by that point being essentially a franchise. So it helped make our movie commercial, but I was not borrowing or inspired by Nightmare on Elm Street or, you know, I liked Nightmare on Elm Street because it had that element in it. Slasher films to me were a little too uninteresting. There was no real imagination involved or you weren't building worlds or getting interested in um, ideas. Uh, and Elm Street took slasher which was still the dominant you know if you're going to make a horror movie basically slasher films were what you were making that was largely what was being made there were some monster movies thanks to alien and then prophecy which was a you know but by and large especially on lower budget it was all slasher stuff so when i saw that realm street i was like oh finally something interesting going on yet yeah, it still has the slashing element which makes it commercial but it's also got ideas in it about dreams and you know the the um, what you can do with the story and the creatively it opened up a whole new avenue. So that's why I liked it. Um, 
why I like Nightmare on Elm Street. But yeah, so Nightmare on Elm Street helped make our movie commercial because otherwise maybe my little weird ideas about dreams and stuff would have been considered too out there. But with Nightmare on Elm Street, then out there was sellable because that's what you're doing. Somebody's going to pick up your movie because they think they can sell it. Uh, and if it's too weird or too standalone, they don't know how to sell it, then your movie's in trouble because they, you know, people want to be able to sell it really easily. And so not on Elm Street helped our movie, but I was not consciously ripping it off. And I was there first only in terms of like wanting to do a horror film revolving largely around nightmares and, and dreams. I would say your movie actually feels to me more like a Lovecraft inspired movie because and it's, it's strange the way it is. It's not my dreams are coming to life. It's somebody else's dreams are coming to life. And it's a weird chain that we're all getting sucked into and constantly reliving it, which I think is a very Lovecraft thing. Like, I think that what's the one the Eric, uh, the music of Eric, what is it, Zahn or something? I think that's, Eric's, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of like that in a little bit, you know, just discovering something that's going to, you shouldn't really discover it because it's going to mess you up. Yeah, and Eric Zahn, I love that story. Yeah, I discovered Lovecraft around the time I started uh, film school. So in the, in the 80s, I found Lovecraft, largely because I liked Robert Block. Yeah. And I went to buy, I went to buy um, textbooks at a bookstore, and there was this collection which Robert Block had done of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stories. And so he'd written an introduction and supposedly selected these stories. I mean, he knew Lovecraft, so I'm sure he had. Um, so I read The Shadow Out of Time first, which is about a sort of kind of previous these none of these which i originally read were um mythos stories you know lovecraft now everybody just thinks it's all about thulu yeah and the whole mythos of lovecraft but they're lovecraft's about a whole bunch of other things too so the stories i took to so i read that i'd read um i think the shunned house yeah uh and uh and um and the outsider which i never really liked but the outsider did have an impact on beyond room's door in terms of this whole idea of an outsider literally like somebody looking in you know into sort of our world and that kind of sort of subterranean idea in that case a guy we find out is coming up out of the grave but i had this whole thing as a kid um i had this idea of this monster sort of coming up out of the sewers to, like grab your car tire and like sort of pull your car down into the sewers so i had that sort of this sort of like that became sort of and that was that was only a dream to me. So maybe that's why I made that a, a dream monster. Cause that was where that image came from. Of course that I've still not worked that image into any movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, dreams give you a lot of freedom, you know what I mean? And it also gets you a chance to dive into your subconscious. This one's somebody else's subconscious, but I don't, it, it's an interesting movie. I mean, there's so many concepts in this one that might be the only knock somebody would have on it is there's a lot going on. So it, it may take one or two views to grasp it, but those movies usually get more interesting as it goes on. Cause I know I spend my time just thinking like about like the thing I'm like, I wonder if they knew they were the thing when they were the stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like how does the science work of it? Just thinking about how did the monster, you know, this kind of stuff like that is interesting to me. So I feel like your movie is pretty good at doing that for me. Good. I mean, the intention is that you could watch it once and keep up with it enough that it makes a certain kind of sense. But if you do go back and watch it, that there's more things you can pick up. You don't have to, to hopefully enjoy and just kind of, you know, you're following this lead character through all these weird things. Some people get caught up with trying to figure out when he's awake and when he's asleep, which I think the movie pretty early on tells you is not, makes no difference. It's not going to save you. It's not going to save him. It's not what, this movie is about everything becoming equally unreal, you know, so the dream is reality and it can, you know, the monster brings its sort of, its sort of abilities of a dream into reality. So it can like make a house disappear and things like that. But yeah, he, the main character is sort of tapped into this um, nightmare, which is kind of like a, a view of another whole alternate universe, you know, a parallel world, um, which if you have dreams and you deal with them regularly, they never really suck you in. They have no power. But the whole point of this movie is the guy never dreams. So any positive dream energy he could have had is is gone and so all the, the dream eventually gets so angry that the only dreams he's going to have are are nightmares and sort of evil dreams and that's that's what enables them to kind of come into come into his world and yeah the idea that the character has no dreams i mean this is based out of film school stuff where people are always like teaching about all these layers of meanings so yeah the dream meaning is also like ambition or goals you know the guy's like 
obviously he's a good student, but he's a good student at math and a lot of very kind of cold personal things. He's not connected with other people. And in the movie, he has to finally try to connect with people in order to save himself. Um, so, you know, it, it's loaded with a lot of double meanings on purpose because that's where it was coming from. Um, and so when you learn things in film school, you're taught about all these various things that films can be. Um, another thing in the movie was the whole poetry uh, yeah. sequence. Um, I thought the dreams should talk in their own way. They wouldn't talk like you or me. So I had seen some sort of video art pieces, which were about poetry, but the poems were always brought to the poem, you know, music, music videos. Sometimes they stick together and sometimes they don't. This is the way these poetry pieces were. So people shoot some kind of interesting video and find some poem, but the two really never ha didn't have anything to do with each other. It was just sort of accidental if the visuals had anything to do. So I wanted to write a poem for the visuals uh, to begin with so that again, the dream would have its own way of talking. Um, so there's sort of a certain kind of um, poetry or rhythms that the dream has that, um, that the rest of the movie it doesn't. So that was sort of an experiment also. And, you know, the dream scenes, Burrigo, I mean, you know, that's part of the excitement of, of, uh, of doing a movie is where you can actually, I, I like montages. Yeah. Where you're telling a story through a collection of images, not just through conversations with people or, you know. So that, so the dream was in there sort of for me. So, I mean, I loved horror movies. Lovecraft at the time, my understanding was, was not public domain yet. So I couldn't do a literal adaptation. Um, I didn't want to get into too complicated a sort of sub universe. So I kind of created my own in terms of the dreams were the yeah. alternate world, the, the old ones were in the dreams kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that was something that I insisted on, on keeping in the feature version, which turned some people off to it. You know, the fact that, oh, the poem, that's it's too, you know, it's a terrible poem. I didn't like that. You know, why didn't you just stick to the monsters? And, you know, I liked all those elements. Um, so yeah, it's set up as kind of a mystery and it's set up as something that maybe you need to see more than once to fully get into. But there's also some people get too much into what the individual dreams mean they're like so interesting what the meaning is that the impact on the story is that people are dying and things are getting increasingly weird and dangerous that's really the that's the meaning of the dream specifically as it goes along um that's what he's trying to get out of and yet trying to then figure out what those other little elements of those things mean that's fine too and hopefully that makes a certain amount of sense <coughs> throughout the movie in the beginning you see him and you see the sort of dinosaur in a frame yeah. And there's like a toy dinosaur his, his non-existent brother has because he's dreaming about having the brother in a family he never had. That, of course, is the beginnings of the monster. The monster is always kind of part of his uh, personality, a part of his head. And obviously the monster gets bigger and scarier as he gets older and builds up more of its own energy. Yeah. So there are sort of three lines. There's, the other thing with the movie is there's a lot of the colors are sort of symbolic and organized in a way to try to help connect connect things. Sometimes the characters dress alike at moments where he's literally passing the dream from one person to another, you know, when they become um, a, a target for the dream, you'll notice the way the colors line up, the greens and the blues, and of course, red, you know, any, the, uh, and also when you're going to kill somebody in a movie, just as a practical matter, uh, we're both wearing dark colors now. Don't have them wear dark colors because blood will never look like blood under dark colors. It's very hard to photograph. Yeah. So usually in all my movies, if somebody's going to die, they're probably wearing tan or white or something like that, because the blood will actually look like blood and you'll immediately see it because you put blood on other colors. Oh, yeah. Just photograph it, <laughs> put a blue light on something red and try to make it look like blood. It's like, it yeah. looks like pancake syrup. And, uh, so anyway. But I mean, that is kind of like if you boil Lovecraft down, it's this kind of catching madness from someone. And basically in this movie, you catch his in his madness. And you said earlier, he's trying to reach out to people. So he tries to reach out to people and essentially he kills them all because of it. Right, right. Yeah. So maybe he yeah, shouldn't maybe, have. <laughs> yeah, maybe he shouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. And he comes to realize that, too. You know, he yeah. says, you know, you're right. I did kill them. But it's the only chance we have now is to work together. I mean, we can't. Yeah, I guess one quick thing about it that I want to mention, you mentioned maybe possibly hiring a like a genre actor for Dr. Knox. Did you reach out to anybody or did you have any people in mind? I know you mentioned one. We Yeah, Dr. Knox, um, who's not in the short, the short version is the two guys. 
there's originally there was a scene with a girlfriend which got dropped from the short because there was no follow-up to it um but in the movie we needed more characters obviously adding a sort of professor on top of the other stuff was uh, an obvious one and his part he is the sort of first to die but it was a part that you could shoot at in a week or less yeah. so if you're looking to do a star cameo yeah you don't want to just be on the phone in two scenes with henry fonda as the president you know that, yeah, that whole yeah. bit um and any number of people and roger corman was funny who would mark singer as the president you know he knew he was going to be in three scenes on the phone exactly sitting behind his desk or in a hotel room <laughs> yeah <laughs> and a convention so we didn't want to we yeah exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. that's that's a given so, we so the knox role wasn't written just to have a star but it was written and obviously that character is older than the other characters so yeah i mean i loved hammer films and all those kind of guys so yeah i mean donald pleasance was sort of a, would have been an obvious choice obviously he was making money doing halloween uh peter cushing uh would have been great um those were probably really the two it was kind of written for to almost the nervous types be. right yeah, exactly right right and peter cushing sort of a smaller could be intellectual could be a little dangerous you're not quite sure what's going on in there when we lost our bigger budget in the shooting 35 thing, <clears throat> it was really down to like kind of bare bones. What, how little can we make the movie for? Cause whatever we could scramble together was all we could get. So we gave up on, at that point we had to either make the movie or not. And so we gave up on trying to like chase down. So we never made any calls or anything. I think probably for an extra <clears throat> 10 to $20,000, which would have been a substantially big bump on our budget we could have got somebody. Somebody later suggested like John Carradine, who would have been okay. He's almost too creepy. Too 1940. <laughs> yeah, almost too creepy, I suppose. Yeah. Um, to the other ones were more contemporary at the time, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I don't think those guys ever get old to me, but I understand what you mean. Oh, I know. It's a little. Dated. I know. Yeah, I don't know. He was kind of. Yeah, he was sort of suggesting more like Frankenstein and 1930s and 40s, you know, stuff. Yeah. And his more recent associations at the time before his kind of career, he had kind of a comeback there at the end. You know, he'd really like bottomed out in these things where he was the president, you know, the weird scientist in two scenes, you know, in these terrible movies, uh, which now I watch and kind of enjoy. But uh, yeah, so I, that was that was the sort of star part. And that's the reason why we gave up on it, because we really needed to kind of shoot this movie Um uh, we were already making plans to move to Los Angeles and stuff. And so it was either this movie gets made or it never does. So we gave up on trying to find a star. There was nobody outside of us to try to like go do it. You know, there was nobody in the production who could have taken the time to make the calls. Had we done so, I think we probably, you know, if we could have gotten somebody for three days for $10,000, it would have been well worth it. The movie would be better known. It would probably be known as a, you know, John Carradine movie or whatever, rather than as a Jay Wolfel movie. Not that that's the way I was thinking at the time, but um, you know, it would be part of their it'd be part of their filmography, which would then drag us into a hole. Now, over time, the movie's kind of gotten discovered on its own anyway. But I I do kind of regret it just because since then I've learned that doing that is not as impossible as you might think. If you give somebody a good role um, and can pay them a reasonable amount of money, if you want them to do this, you know, if you want Daniel Craig to come play James Bond in a movie, you know, you're going to have to spend millions and millions oh, yeah. of dollars. If you want to come play the Easter bunny who speaks Russian, he'd do it just as an actor. As almost <laughs> kind of a lot. His agents probably wouldn't even want him to do it, but he's like, no, no. When am I, when else am I going to get to play the Easter bunny? Russian. Easter so, bunny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Russian Easter bunny. Yeah. Um, so that's a big, that's a big thing in terms of like getting, getting actors. If you don't have a ton of money, getting, uh, good actors interested in something you're doing is to do something different. Now, of course, have Donald Pleasance or Christopher Lee or, you know, been in horror movies. Yeah. So maybe that wouldn't have necessarily protected us, but, uh, you know, we're not asking him to come play the Frankenstein monster or the, you know, the automatic expert, like Pleasance became the expert in everything, you know, Halloween. Yeah. You know, in this case, the character is an outsider who's not sure what's real and what is it. And you also, if you did get somebody like that, then you get a little bit of that psycho factor in terms of I don't think you expect them to, for the monster to kill them off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Since, that character, since the monster gets, since the guy who knows how to kill vampires and kick ass in horror movies is suddenly wiped out of your movie, you hopefully you'd get a little bit of, a, oh, shit, now who's going to save his ass? <laughs> the, the star is gone. 
Uh, Steven Seagal, an executive decision, right? Exactly. I love that. <laughs> I'm glad he was out though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. No, he, he they used him just enough to be good, you know. Yeah, just he enough just to get rid of him. Yeah, if he was the guy crawling around instead of John Leguizamo later, you know, the movie <laughs> loses its. But the, yeah, in that case, he, and he got a chicken out of that movie because he was supposed to be on the posters too. Oh but yeah, was surprised, you know, and then he didn't want to do that, so the poster just has a big blank spot where Steven Seagal's head was supposed to be, you know. Kurt Russell's kind of off to one side and there's this place where Steven Seagal's head was supposed to be. I'd rather just see Kurt Russell, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Just put his head right in the middle close to where it belongs. Um, I got one more quick question on uh, Beyond Dreams Door. I noticed you mentioned Fulci and you mentioned Seven Doors of Death, the AK title for the Beyond. So I'm wondering if the title Beyond Dreams Door was uh, insp- inspired by Seven Doors of Death, possibly? I, the version I saw of Seven Doors of Death was Seven Doors of Death originally on a big oversized videotape, and it was kind of the hacked up version and stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure if I even finally... I, well, I did, I'd seen Fulci movies before I made this, because um, there was a shot we didn't do in the movie. Um, when there's this sort of central dream scene, there's all these sort of dead dreamers or sort of zombies outside this abandoned house which in a way is a little bit of a Night of the Living Dead kind of homage. As we were starting to pack up, the sun was going down. And I was like, oh man, if we put the lights inside the house, we could put the dead people in there and you'd see these shadows moving oh, around, yeah, which is yeah. pretty much a shot right from the beyond, you know, where you see the people inside the, yeah. and I kind of didn't do it. because I was like, well, that's a little too, now I'm just ripping Fulci off. Um, yeah, beyond, the beyond, yeah, beyond, um, really came more from Lovecraft than that, but I was interested in that movie and that movie certainly has the whole, and then they will face the truth, you know, the whole, they step out of their world and there are certainly elements which are similar. Uh, and I had seen it by the time I made Beyond Dreamstore, but I think I'd already written the script because I wrote the script several years before we actually got to make the movie. Um, so I knew a lot more about Fulci by the time I made the movie than when I wrote the, the screenplay. Well, I mean, Lovecraft and Fulci to me in that kind of era, they go hand in hand. They are very similar in that kind of weird dream logic and that's his yeah and that's his most lovecraft like movie i I presume that he got the idea beyond the wall of sleep you know i mean that's the lovecraft title that um uh, so yeah i was looking for a lovecraft like title and i knew those doors were an actual physical location so they're beyond the door and then dreams so beyond dreams door is how the title came to me i think i wrote the poem before i actually wrote the rest of the script to try to figure out what that was but it wasn't just a door into uh, the thing was that that door is a physical location in our film school yeah it's always like well, what's underneath them and so that again got me thinking about well what's you know what's on the other side of that door christopher lee always said the most suspenseful thing in the movie was a closed door because you never know what's going to be on the other side of it you build up a lot of suspense walking up to the door if it's going to open first you know you see the doorknobs turning slowly carpenter does that well in some movies the thing the great shot of the door thing turning you know when they're all yeah so that's how the whole the whole idea kind of came from is what what if the door opens up into something that's not what you'd expect to be there. And there's some stories there's stories like that where people look out a, a window and they're looking not into they uh, there's a story where um I forget the author where somebody moves into an apartment or a room they've not been in and they look out the window and you know they don't think much of it when they go outside and look back at the house they realize that what they looked at outside that window is not what's outside that window. Yeah, that's always haunting. Or yeah. they move somewhere and there's a locked door and it's like nailed shut. You're like, he's like, don't open it. Just just leave it alone. Yeah. Trust me. It was nailed shut for a reason. Yes, yes, yes. I did a short film called Come to Me Softly that got worked into the long version of Beyond Dream's Door, yeah. which was based on a Hawthorne idea. And the idea was, what if you heard a knock on a door that doesn't go anywhere? you know, a locked door, a door, but, you know, like the closet, like you're at home at night and somebody's knocking from inside of your closet wanting to get out. And so that whole, that I turned that into a whole movie of this series of doors, a character keeps hearing knocks on, keeps opening and they just keep bleeding deeper and deeper into something. Yeah, doors are scary. Doors are scary, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ghost Lake, which was 2004, right? Yeah, I made Beyond Dreams Door. It came out in 1989. By the time it came out, I'd moved to Los Angeles. Okay. Um, and uh, But before we left, there was a number of treatments which we developed with the original distributor, Beyond Dreams Door, to do his movies. We ended up suing them, and they settled out of court and paid us what, we would, what, we, what they should have paid us plus more. Um, but there was a whole bunch of material developed that never got made into anything. Um, Ghost Lake 
uh, the original title was The Empty Lake, was a was a sort of half-formed treatment. I think I'd started writing a script, maybe six or eight pages of something, and a general idea for this place where um, my family had a cottage called Rushford Lake in New York. So it was originally written almost as a sort of like female version of Beyond Dream's Door. There's a lead female character who right at the beginning is tossed into this. In her case, it deals with ghosts. Um, but then it, it never got finished. Yeah, but that was so it was originally developed as one of several things that were follow-up projects for Beyond Dream's Door, all of which have become scripts. Um, only one, well, two of which have become movies since then. The other one being Asylum of Darkness or Season of Darkness, which was written as a follow-up to Beyond Dream's Door, also in terms of being weird and what's real and what isn't and all this kind of stuff. That was um, picked later to be made as a movie by another producer out here who then never made another movie and written as a script. And so all these things over time get made. But Ghost Lake was originally one of these follow-up projects. So I always wanted to go back to Ohio to make a film because I thought I could make a bigger production, more interesting on a lower budget there than I could in Los Angeles where I was working for a bunch of different companies editing and also directing movies. Uh, but I could never convince anybody to let me take their production out of LA. They always wanted you here. Your schedules were always very short. Um, so eventually um, we're going to do something. Uh, Johnny Young and I, who met and worked on several things together, we're looking for something we could do as a standalone movie. And uh, Ghost Lake, I knew the location. It was actually in New York, but my cousin still owned that cottage. And so I went back. I had to think that it was on a big five inch floppy drive. This, whatever resistance of the script, I had to go pay somebody to pull that off for me. And I turned it into a script um, to be shot for that location very specifically. And that location was a artificially made lake where there used to be a town underneath it. That was the real facts of that lake. So that was the kind of basis of that story. Um, but again, it was, it was, a, it was a woman um, as the lead. And in this case, it's a, a, again, there's a sort of Lovecraft inspiration um, her last name is, her name is Rebecca Haster, and there's a Lovecraft character whose last name is Haster also. There's also a scene which is basically, uh, I think, the thing at the doorstep, okay. where the fisherman comes to the door and, like, vomits up all this water and is making these weird glug glug sounds. Um, those are the real sort of Lovecraft uh, aspects of that particular movie. But, yeah, so then it just, it finally got made then in 2000, I think it came out in 2005, it was made in 2004. Um, during Hurricane King Katrina, yeah, which uh, meant that it rained. We weren't anywhere near Louisiana, but we were in the same sort of storm belt. Oh, so yeah. it rained was unseasonably cold, you know, during that whole shoot. Yeah, I noticed a lot of breaths and a lot of people in water, and I was thinking, man, I would not want to do that because if you ever been in a movie and you're getting wet, you're getting sick. You're going to get sick because you're traveling. You're not sleep. You're getting sick. So just, just take some vitamin C. But um, you said this was not shot in L.A. or was it? You said Ohio? It was not. It was shot in New York, a place called Rushford, New York. Where was that again? Um, it's Rushford. It's about an hour south of Buffalo. Okay. Okay. It's yeah, it looked cold. Late. Yeah, it was very, very, it was very, very cold. We waited to do the stuff in the water until it was relatively warm, which was still very very cold we had a space here they could jump out and we kept putting it off i was like we got to wait for a warmer night um to do these water scenes um there's less stuff in the water than maybe there was in the script for that reason uh, oh, yeah. most of the movie you're wondering what happens underwater but you almost never get underwater um which again was sort of, i think you need to sort of make virtues of your limitations so originally the idea was we'd put some cameras underwater or do something which is completely impractical, especially with HD. Oh yeah. But uh, the way the movie turned out, you're largely, you don't get underwater. So the whole mystery is like, well, what's really under there? And I just sort of, just sort of said, okay, well, that's what this movie's about because we're not going to get underwater very often. Right at the climax, we do briefly finally see what's under there. We hint at it. It was pretty ambitious. Like right when I went, when I saw it, I was like, there's a lot of boats and like a location. It looks like a pain in the ass because water and electrical equipment and cold is just like, nah, it's not, it's a pain in the ass for sure. I guarantee it. That, that movie was basically made by seven people, including the actors who usually crewed on it. Um, two of the two guy actors, uh, I've remained friends with all of them. Um, 
but uh, they actually were from that area, which I didn't know. So they found us some additional actors yeah. uh, who they've done you know, stuff with and their families were able to come visit the set, which I'm sure was fun with them. They still live and work in LA, Greg and, and uh, Tim. Um, but yeah, that movie is basically made by seven people. We shot, I believe, for 26 days straight, no days off, um, which I don't recommend. It's just kind of the way, you know, we were, we were going to try to shoot it in 18 and then the weather like slowed things down to just such an extent that we just had to shoot extra days. Um, there was virtually no pickups on that movie. So we got everything we needed in that shoot. There were problems getting the effects done. Pretty much all the actual effects were shot in the last day and a half of the movie so it really wasn't until the final day or two while the shoot that i realized i even had a movie oh yeah you know, i was like there's still so many missing elements and stuff it's like this movie we've shot all this stuff but we're still not complete but it'd be it really pretty much the last day after we did this one scene i realized i could finish the film and i was just so happy because for most of that 26 days i had no idea if we could ever finish if there was a movie there um, but the other thing about that movie is we largely slept and lived in that cottage at that lake. So there was almost no driving to locations. There were some, but pretty much we would get up and walk right outside and we could shoot. So we could shoot part of the scene. If it rained us out, we'd just come back when it wasn't raining a couple of days later. Um, so in some ways it's ambition. It was a little, it was a little easier than it looks at some point, but it was not an easy film to make. I think it's one of my better movies probably. And your actors and can't they, escape if they're on location, right? Man. And cell phones don't work there either. There was really no <laughs> internet or cell phones. There weren't any distractions. Oh, I do uh, see Tatum that a lot. Stuff. Just people yeah, Tatum, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. During uh, my one movie during the dubbing, the, the actress was basically like this. And then she'd like say her line, and then she'd be like this. And she never missed a cue, but it was just like, oh, my God, put the freaking oh, yeah. give me that phone. Anyway, the first day of that shoot, Tatum, who was the only one who had a cell phone, dropped it and it broke. And so that was the end of anybody having a cell phone. And basically there was no reception there anyway. Yeah. So no internet, no cell phones, no waiting on people to just go bang on their door. Get up. We got to shoot right now. Um, so on that level, it was sort of easy. But yeah, it was a very, a very tough shoot. But a really cool location because it was cold. Uh, we had all this cool mist and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it was really, and we had basically had the lake to ourselves. Everybody had gone home. So it was like this huge set of this lake, just all to our, all to ourselves. It's pretty much starts kind of like a classic ghost story in like, you know, the changeling. It always, a lot of ghost stories always end up with like starting and beginning with the tragedy. And the, the way the story unfolded, it felt like maybe there was something personal with like loss or something in there. I'm just wondering. The, um, uh, I did have a sort of back before, uh, before and after it's really more about sort of a loss of a, a weirdly a girlfriend than a, than a death yeah um so that's kind of the loss going on but it is sort of reaction to two sort of relationships that ended before i actually got around to making that movie um so the rest of it's just good acting or or you know good writing or good atmosphere so i mean it, it tells a sort of personal story but not specifically about death it's it's more about i mean that whole story is set up where, um, you know, it's a sort of shuttered character who like goes out for a night on the town and has a sort of one nighter and this essentially like kills her, kills her family. I mean, that's the sort of sexual Freudian hurdle. She's, yeah. Yeah. I noticed that know, every time she has sex. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in movies that became a whole kind of thing after Halloween, you know, Carpenter saying, I didn't mean to kill the sexual revolution. Sorry. <laughs> and that really did at the time people saw that movie it associated section of death in, in a sort of scary way um and so ghost lake is really about her not becoming that character being that character you know yes i'm gonna have i'm gonna have a sec i'm gonna have there's a sexual element to my life despite these horrible things yeah so it's a sort of challenge for her not to give up on what you need in your in your life um, despite it sometimes resulting in, in bad things. So that's my plea to, you know, as bad as it gets, keep having sex. It'll, it'll save you in the end. They're not exclusively, you know, every time you do it, it's not just bad luck, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Don't, there's no cause and effect. It's a but coincidence. She thinks, there, she thinks there is, you know, that's yeah, the yeah. whole. Well, that makes sense. Uh, there was a, we did a re-edit of that movie at one point based on some notes where people felt that you shouldn't a couple of friends of mine thought that you shouldn't know right up front what happened 
yeah. know, that she's running from something that you don't know what it is. And then later in the movie, she does tell the story of what brought her there when she meets somebody. It's like, what happened to you? And that that's when you should real, re realize what caused it all. So I did an edit of the film that way, where you didn't know right up front what, you know, she, we knew that people had died. We didn't know most of it. And uh, I showed it to a distributor who passed on the movie. And then watching it again myself, it's like the movie doesn't work now. If you don't know why she's so panicked, you know, there's plenty of mystery in the movie anyway. You need to know right up front what is driving her out of her house into this weird location. And the whole movie didn't work when you took that out. It was an interesting lesson to learn. The flashback worked fine later, but though you just didn't you didn't connect with her immediately unless you knew what the sort of horror was that drove her. Yeah. To, to face the ghosts. Did you want to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming release of Homegrown Whores Volume 1 from Vinegar Syndrome? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, Beyond Dream's Door, it came out in uh, 1989 in the States. And uh, Vid America was the releasing company who were out of business by, I think, like about 1992. So the movie would turn up in like used bins and stuff like this from time to time. It was released overseas in several countries also. Japan had a pretty big release of it um so eventually when dvd was coming around in 2000 whatever it was when you know everybody was starting to realize we could take these old films and have do them on dvds um i i i did a i did a big dvd version of that movie that cinema epoch ended up bringing out but i basically produced the entire dvd on my own and then took it to cinema epoch um, i shopped it around through a whole bunch of companies took a year, um, nobody picked it up. Cinema Epoch picked it up and brought it out on DVD. So after that, um, people would call me up from film festivals once in a while and want to show the movie. Um, one time in Austin, Texas, contacted me and wanted to show a print. I was like, there is no print. <coughs> and then it did come out as a little, uh, as a standalone sort of a limited run to this company called Lo-Fi, which actually brought it on in VHS again. This was maybe six years ago, six or seven years, very limited run. Um, then four years ago, let's say like bootlegs of it started showing up on YouTube, like really regularly, yeah. the whole movie all of a sudden. And I would have them taken down. And then not long after that, uh, distributors started contacting me asking, well, what's going on with the film? You know, could we release it? Um, and so uh, ultimately four different distributors wanted the movie. I ended up picking Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, the final or maybe five did because somebody came to me after i'd already made the commitment with vinegar as we talked about earlier since the movie was shot on film i didn't want to do a fakey up res re-release it already come out on dvd and standard def because there was no hd the first time it came out so when these companies contacted me i was like well we didn't cut the negative but there is a negative so i'd want to go back to the negative and transfer it so we have a real blu-ray a real hd version yeah. not an up res. <clears throat> and they either couldn't do that or weren't willing to the expense for that and vinegar syndrome and then contact me understood that they had never done that with the film previously but they understood that people had done that you know television production before that you know star trek the next generation was shot on film but all the post was on video i mean it was a standard thing for tv um so they were willing to like undertake doing the job now beyond his door was shot on a pretty low ratio but that still meant transferring 13 about 14 hours of material to cut down into an 80 minute movie. Uh, it all basically had to be eye matched. Um, there was no, I did have window burn time code, but anyway, it, it was a massive job. Yeah, it's rough. And so yeah, it's rough. I, you know, but they were willing to do it. And then you'd have a real H, there'd really be a reason to watch it in Blu-ray. It wouldn't be like an up res of a standard deaf video, you know, kind of thing. So how was it working with vinegar? Did, were they good with it? They were good. They were very committed and they, they did a really nice job of doing that. The, the frame match edit and we cleaned up like hairs and dirt, which had always been in the film. Um, we had to deal with some, uh, a little bit of missing material, which we had to source from two other different sources to put it together. The opening titles, which had been shot on film, um, that had gotten lost. The negative was missing, but I still had the actual physical um sheets they're plastic yeah. sheets with the lettering on them so i actually had somebody recreate the opening titles from the original title cards it was literally animated you know each 
move is a separate cell. It's cell animation for the titles. So that was redone uh, from the original elements. And, uh, and then the mix needed to be laid back and all this kind of stuff. And they also ported over all the DVD extras. When I did Beyond Him's Door the first time, by that point, there had been some people who'd contacted me who really liked the movie. And so I was like, people who like this film really like it. So I want to try to satisfy its biggest fan. You know, so anything that's not on there, let's put on there. Let's make the ultimate DVD. And extras were a big selling point of DVDs originally. These special yeah. features and extras were why people bought stuff. So, Al, and people had contacted me looking for DVDs. Um, you can still buy used ones. Um, and people had contacted me. I said, the movie may get re-released, but it'll probably never have this many extras on it again. So you should really buy that first DVD if you get a chance. Um, I've sold a few copies to people that way myself. So yeah, and Vinegar Syndrome, and Vinegar Syndrome does a lot of movies. So you're part of the big machine that's putting out a bunch of titles and working on a whole bunch of things at a time. So there were gaps where I was like, is anything going on with this movie? Um, but they came back and they, you know, and they did port over virtually all of the original special features. They shot new interviews with uh, a lot of the cast and crew. I found some behind the scenes footage, which had gotten lost, which I've discovered since. So we'd never been on anything before. So that's on there and uh, the, some audition tapes also. So all the old stuff is on there, plus um, some new old stuff. And then whatever they've done, I've not seen what they did with these new interviews. So I don't know what everybody said. Uh, there's a new commentary track. I know what everybody said on that because I'm part of it. Yeah, that's cool. But, uh, so they were committed. Yeah. So yeah, it does have all the, you know, but I don't know what the menus look like. I've not seen the final disc. Oh. Um, so there's, you know, on the other one, the original DVD, I knew everything on there because I produced it myself. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. By the time it came out, it was just a relief. It's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God that's over. At this time, there is kind of an element of surprise, you know, because they're doing the work. Well, they're pretty much one of the most respected. Like I buy a lot of disc and everything, and I have a lot of friends that buy a lot of disc and I'd say about 50% of them, you ask the best company out there for horror movies and genre films, it's Vinegar Syndrome. I think I think they personally do the best job on stuff. Like a lot of the movies, you know, some of the movies aren't great, but a lot of the movies I love and they do a lot of gems and they always release the movies that you may not like, but somebody else is going to love it. So when you find that gem and they, they clean up, clean them up really nice. I was wondering if you actually had seen any of the print, any of the footage cleaned up from them. I have, yeah. I mean, they sent me... Um... Yeah, I, you know, they, since they had to eye match the original edit, they sent me a copy and they had missed a few things and things about dissolve lengths and stuff to clean up. And then they sent me a, a check disc of the final color corrected version from the, from the 2K. Yeah. Um, I sent them myself and the DP and the producer sent them some notes. So they've done hopefully those fixes for the final, but that final I have not seen. But yeah, I've seen the HD version. It's almost like being on set again. That's great. Um, the you know the 16 is what it is and the movie has lots of blues and reds in it which vhs did not handle oh yeah, well. yeah you know reds was kind of bloom so now it's not just something red it's like shades of red and shades of blue and so that was real satisfying and interesting and 16 yeah you're seeing more grain certainly than you normally would in a 35 thing but they did and they did a little bit of suppression on that but it's not distracting at all um, so yeah, it really does look and sound the best that it ever has. And like, sometimes, like I said, it was like being on set again. The other thing is originally they put this short, which I talked about kind of me softly that was originally cut into the film to pad it for length because the original release, they wanted it to be 86 minutes long. The original, the, not Vid America, but our original sales agent. Um, so that short is on there as a standalone movie and they retransferred that that was shot in 35. So that looks great too. So you get that 30, 35 short. Um, which was originally cut into the movie. I like it as a short. It's just cutting it into the movie was, a, you know. Yeah, it doesn't make any sort sense. Of, sort of bogus. Yeah, the other thing I learned, um, you kind of mentioned, was um, the original version, since it was 80 minutes, they wanted to pad it out. So I really learned a lot first dealing with a sales agent in terms of like, since the movie was short, they wanted stuff added in. And they had all these ideas about, well, one of their ideas was, what if the whole thing's just a dream? At the end, we just like we show everything you've seen in the movie in like a fast. fast. And that, of course, was the movie I specifically set out not to make. Yeah, we've seen the Wizard Something of Oz, just, right? Uh, yeah, remember that? Oh my God, it's all yeah, my, exactly. You can't do that more yeah. than a couple times, right? 
yeah, that was great in that, but yeah, it's all a dream. Um, <laughs> a friend of a friend of mine uh, wrote a Bruce Willis movie, which he was making right after The Sixth Sense. And so The Sixth Sense, Bruce was, you know, the twist ending. That's what, oh. Yeah, yeah. So he was always yeah. thinking, so making this next movie right afterwards, he was thinking, oh, I got to have a twist as good as The Sixth Sense, you know. Not forget that the movie had nothing to do with the twist ending, but he just thought, oh, the movie's called The Kid. So one day he came to the writer and said, I got a great idea. What if it's all a dream? Of course, they talked him out of it, but uh, yeah. yeah. What if it's all a dream? That only works in Wizard of Oz and Nightmare City, right? <laughs> That's right. And then the nightmare became reality. <laughs> <laughs> That movie, you don't care though, because it's so, you're like, oh, I know. Whatever. I love it. Yeah. It's like that. That's kind, of, that's kind of the greatest thing in that movie. Yeah. And then the Nightmare Became Reality. I'm pretty sure I probably used that as kind of a joke on the set of Beyond Dreams Door at one point or another. <laughs> and what happens? And the Nightmare Becomes Reality. What else could happen? But anyway, when I, when I started dealing with a sales agent, when I was starting to deal with, when I was starting to deal with that sales agent, you know, we were, I started to learn why sometimes you're watching a movie and there'll be stuff in it that seems like it was done by other people or has, you know, like the movie's so good and suddenly there's something in there that just seems so stupid or just from some other movie. I think usually that's become because of a distributor or a star or somebody's insisting on adding that into the movie. You can kind of tell. Um, but I didn't really understand that because you watch a film and suddenly it has a really dumb ending or there's just some scene that's so terrible it takes you out of the whole film and you need to kind of give the filmmakers a break because probably it wasn't their idea. Sometimes it's even like a network or a TV station that needs more running time and they actually do their own creative edits or you know the reels get put together backwards, just all this crazy stuff and smart asses and of course we're all smart asses when we first start making movies. You know, you're like, oh, the filmmakers did a great job. And then they just lost their minds. Like, you know, somebody, <laughs> else's mind, somebody else's mind was 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 running the show. You know, I didn't understand that before making a movie and dealing oh, with yeah, that kind yeah. of input. Input. There's my input. Uh, yeah. And the bigger the budget, the more likely it's going to happen. That's why, like, you watch the Marvel movies and you're like, these are fun, but you can tell they're all the same movie. Like the showrunner, there's a showrunner on this chain, like whitewashing everything, like except a couple of them. But it's just the way it is. Yep. Yep. No, it's yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Every yeah. It, what's weird is that when you write a script in in Hollywood or any script, but especially in Hollywood, they spend a lot of time on these scripts. And they're really careful about giving you all these notes and stuff. And then when they actually make it, they basically just all the wheels come off. Like everybody and his brother can come up with a scene and put it in the movie. The actor just bought a new boat. We need to have a scene with a guy in a boat. They just do it. So they spend all this time beating up the writer and controlling it. And then when they really should make sure it's the movie they were trying to make, they just do whatever, you know. Yeah, you can see a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Bruce Willis earlier, and you, I just immediately thought of Die Hard, even though Die Hard's great, but it's just like he was worried about them filming from above because he was going bald so young that he was worried about it when he was that young. He's like, don't film me like that. But uh, I, I mean, I, a lot of these big stars, they're, they're vanity. I understand, I guess, to a certain point, but. Yeah, they're like, if people are paying attention to that, you know, you're not really doing your job. You know, I mean, the, the angle needs to be up there for a reason that's going to. Oh, yeah make the scene work and you know it's not we're not trying to make you look bad we're trying to make a movie here there's this story of, uh, yeah there's this clint eastwood story i love that i don't think has been told anywhere a friend of mine courtney joiner told me this story where he was making a perfect world with kevin costner yeah. and kevin costner got angry because some extra kept blowing the scene he wasn't he wasn't hitting his he was driving this tractor he was supposed to stop and all this stuff and he wasn't doing it and he was blowing the takes and so kevin costner finally was and the guy's like hey, i've got headphones the headphones aren't working i can't hear you telling me to stop and so costner threw a fit and like went in his trail i can't work with stuff like this so eastwood got costner's double and just like it was a wide shot and just shot the scene anyway and so then kevin costner like comes out of his trailer like an hour later it's like okay all right I, you know I, I i've calmed down let's what do we need to do here let's let's do the shot and Clint Eastwood was like, oh, we shot that. We shot that shot. We've already moved on to something else. We're here to make a movie, not fuck around. 
Yeah, that's the one thing about Eastwood is like you watch movies and he's not really that afraid to look stupid or look weird in his movies. Like he's done some weird things. Like I always remember that scene. It always is stuck in my head and I'm forgiven where he, he, they shoot the guy, the first guy, and they feel real bad. And he's sitting there picking the rocks like a four-year-old, real nervous four-year-old knowing that he just feels like shit. And I was like, that's a really unique moment that takes away that the whole movie's kind of about taking the mystique away from the Western, you know, but it's just a great scene. And you just, don't see that much from guys like that doing that kind of stuff. Vulnerability. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And some scenes he, you know, he, he did later where he's playing like old guy and he'd take off his shirt and you could tell he's, I mean, he's in shape, but he's not, you know, he's got yeah. an old guy. He's not Charlie him, Bronson. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, he was, he, he was perfectly willing to do that. He, yeah. The point is, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. So I'll look older if I don't have my shirt on kind of thing, you know. Where other actors, you know, would refuse to do that or get a body double or something yeah. silly, you know. But uh, I just wanted to basically mention I'm really glad that all the features are ported over from the old disc because if you're a crazy collector like me and stuff like that, you always want to make sure you got your disc ported over the features because then you can retire it. You know, you don't have to have it anymore if because I got both the DVDs. Um, the original uh, Cinema Epoch, and then I have the Lo-Fi DVD, and now finally I will have the uh, Blu-ray set. Well. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, the yeah, and it is the director's cut. Um, and there's you know, it's a whole different transfer. So the each version has had its own hopefully better things. So hopefully now we've made it even better. But yeah, I hate that where you buy something, but then it's like you're still stuck with the old thing because there's some extra or something. You know, these things behind me, like there's like multiple copies of some stuff in there because each version comes out with something cool and loses something that you thought was really interesting. You know, exactly. his rights, they can't acquire it or they just won't buy it. His stuff just gets lost, you know, over time. Or commentary, they say something they shouldn't have said and now they don't want to put it on the disc because somebody slipped about somebody else. But uh, if you have anything else to mention about it, I know that we maybe mentioned the two movies that come with it. Uh, Fatal Exam, which I'm not familiar with, and Winter Beast, which is a pretty crazy Evil Dead stop motion weird movie I haven't seen in 20 years, so... Yeah, I, I've never seen Fatal Exam. I think I've seen Winter Beast, but uh, the scenes I've seen from it, which they've shown, I don't remember. I think I'd have, I think I would remember that scene. But I remember some movie about totems with stop motion in it, because there's not a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, it's a strange uh, film. Yeah, so I'm interested to see that again. I mean, I know that movie was shot over a long period of time, so that always movies get really inconsistent when you have to do that. Beyond Room's Door was shot it was shot pretty much in a real concentrated amount of time so at least we didn't have that problem or that issue to fight with but if you're making a movie on your own sometimes you got to shoot as long as you can and then come back to it later you get a bigger movie but then sometimes i i was hired to edit a movie that the lead actor had gone bald and they'd shot the film over a two-year period so there were scenes where he's got lots of hair and then he'd be bald lots of hair eventually they put a hat on him so now he's wearing a hat now he's bald now he's got lots of hair. That's what years cool is pretty like, dramatic. Yeah, you know, just, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when filmmakers, I don't think even noticed it initially. And when they started editing, they're like, oh, man, we got to give him a hat. People can tell, you know. And there was some cool stuff. They went up, they got, yeah. Uh, assistant editor of mine worked on Waterworld. And after Kevin Reynolds was fired, Kevin Costner both reshot and hired CG guys to, like, make him look less bald. Because he has, like, cornrows and his hair's wet. So yeah. sometimes he felt he looked too bald. So they went back and reshot and did this stuff just to, you know, again, you're talking about vanity. It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Usually when you're going bald, you get five, 10, 15, 20 years. If it goes real fast, that's, I don't know that <laughs> some people are unlucky yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But who, you know, who knew that would, that would be their problem. And in that particular movie, they went to Alaska. So they had this spectacular stuff with him in Alaska, but now he's wearing a hat and he's bald and he's got hair. And so it was like, it's like, do you throw out the really cool footage in Alaska with like whales and looking off a boat? You know, I wouldn't. I don't think the movie. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. I, they, I don't think they ever finished it. And I don't think the movie ever came out. But the, some, some people who were, wanted to pick up some of my movies are going to hire me to fix that one for them. But unfortunately, I don't think it's fixed. I bring up a story from, uh, I recently got that Nosferatu in Venice, the, um, 
the one uh, with uh, Klaus Kinski, and they tell this ridiculous story where they shot all this stuff. There's this big party going to happen, this parade. So they it was before Klaus Kinski showed up. So it was supposed to be a spiritual sequel to Nosferatu, the Herzog one. So they like filmed this extra with the bald cap and everything, running through all these great like parade. And it was a one time deal. You get you get it when you get it. So Klaus Kinski shows up with long hair and he says, "I'm not putting that bald cap on. I'm not doing any of that." So they're like. Uh, and they had to throw the footage away. I, I would have said, okay, um, I'm getting somebody else, but hey, I, I guess I'm in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, Kinski was Kinski wanted to make his Paganini movie yeah. uh, right after that. I mean, that was his dream project. So he wasn't going to, he's like, no, I grew my hair out for Paganini. I'm not going to cut it. And I hate those bald caps, you know, so get that stuff away from me. I remember kind of liking that movie. I haven't seen the Blu-ray. I know it just came out. But uh, yeah, and then he directed some of that movie too. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy. It's nuts. I mean, it has a good cast and um, it's fun. It's fun watching those guys just be weird. I mean, like they said that, I remember hearing them talk about the Donald Pleasant just eating the whole time. And I was like, that's bold. And I watched it. I was like, yeah, he's just, he's just in the background eating all day. He could have been, he could have been in Beyond Dream's door snacking on some cakes the entire movie. <laughs> yeah, see, I just should have known that at the time. That was, that was my curse. You were talking about, I read Kinski's autobiography at one point. I loaned it to a friend and never got it back because the book was later recalled and they like cut stuff out of it, which Kinski was talking about and sort of pasteurized it and brought it back out. So I wish I still had that original. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a scorching autobiography. I mean, he's, you know, he's as hard on himself as on anybody else. Um, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say? I mean, well, Klaus Kinski, we could have got Klaus Kinski to be, uh, you know, <laughs> it would have never came out. <laughs> well, that's true. We'd never finished shooting potentially. Still be shooting it right now. You'd be using He'd his dead body though. Like, yeah. He's like, well, you got to wait till I finish shooting with finish shooting Fitz Corral though, down in South America, you know, so I'd still be in Ohio waiting for Klaus Kinski to, I'd be having somebody create. I'd be having somebody create a CGI Klaus Kinski so I could somehow finish Beyond Dream's door. You know, connect the dots. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and talking. It was fun. I'm sorry we, I kind of messed up the timing. It's a little hard to get timing down on these Zoom calls. I don't think people realize that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Nothing's easy. <laughs> if something's worth doing, you just that, that. That's my message about making films too. It's like. Don't make a movie because you think it's going to be easy because they never are. No. You got to make it because you want to make it. Because otherwise, if you go in thinking it'll be easy and then it's not, now you're just angry. You're still, you're, now you're stuck, you're, you're stuck making the movie anyway. Now you just have a bad attitude about it. Oh, yeah. Because some, some of the best movies are, are the hardest to make, like Ghost Lake. Beyond Him's Door was not impossible to make, but it was very difficult to shoot. We had to reshoot a lot of the special effects towards the end and, uh, you know, so nothing's ever easy, but if something's worth doing, don't let the technology stop you from doing it because it will always try. You know, your greatest new app, the thing which is supposed to make life easier, you know, will crash or corrupt or update. And, you know, don't ever think anything will be easy and your life will be a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. So again, I want to thank you. And um, I think that um, the homegrown horse is in the vinegar syndrome package for April this month. You probably, if you order it, it should be getting it at the end of the month with the three movies. Um, there's all new features and there's all the old features and stuff like that. I moderated a commentary with Nick on there, the lead actor. Hopefully that turned out decent. I have not heard it. Um, if it's bad, it was um, vinegar syndrome fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, yeah, I, I've not heard that either. So that's another sort of surprise feature for me is I think Nick was happy with it. He was finally glad to do that i was supposed to come there and do that but i think my father died or there was some there was a bunch of sort of complications um so i wanted to get to do this with you because i know you're a real sort of advocate for them picking up the movie to begin with yeah i should also point out real quickly that you're dave parker and there's another dave parker who's a filmmaker who i've yeah. written stuff with and done productions with and so like things and things there's Dave Parker and Dave Parker and they're not the same Dave Parker. No, he's the, he's the one that's much better at what he does than I do. I'm just doing this for fun. But uh, yeah, I always did that. And I actually, and He knows me too. Cause I brought this up and he was, Oh yeah, I know that guy. Yeah. I used to bother so, him when yeah. I was like 12 years old online. Uh, right when the internet came, I was like 12 or 13. And I looked up filmmakers to talk to and ask annoying questions. And he was nice enough to answer some of my questions. And it was funny that he had the same name. So I always kept <laughs> up on his movies. So. 
yeah no he's a good guy a good filmmaker yeah yeah he and i go way back we were both new kids in la around the same time so we met when we were both relatively new to los angeles we we're like almost exactly 10 years different in age but in terms of our la experience you know we, he worked on things that was the i, I actually paid him myself on that because i wanted an assistant director and they weren't going to pay for one so i paid him out of that and uh he helped me edit that movie and he said I taught him how to edit and he edits a lot and stuff. So groovy. But anyway, so yeah, one J Wolfel, multiple Dave Parkers, not to be confused. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the most generic name in history. So um I just thank you for coming again and uh check out the new release. It's pretty I guarantee it looks great. I think it will. Uh, we'll all find out together. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So all right, thanks, man. Oh,